Hello, a very good morning. It's seven o'clock. Coming up on today's show, an astonishing political comeback for George Galloway, who wins the Rochdale by-election. He said Keir Starmer was on notice and it was a vote for Gaza. We'll get Labour's view in the next few minutes. Plus, we'll hear about what MPs are calling one of the biggest medical frauds of the 20th century. It's Friday the 1st of March. I do hereby declare that George Galloway is <laughs> duly... George Galloway is back, winning in Rochdale with more than 12,000 votes. Keir Starmer, this is for Gaza. Condemnation of Israel after more than 100 people are killed in Gaza while trying to receive humanitarian aid. A Sky News investigation reveals the company making millions from Gaza's misery and people desperate to get out. The National Audit Office warns that the cost of the government's Rwanda asylum scheme could soar to £500 million. A greater threat to global health than hunger. Researchers say there are now more than one billion obese people worldwide. And in sport, Red Bull boss Christian Horner has dismissed anonymous speculation after alleged evidence in his misconduct investigation is leaked on the first day of the new Formula One season. Hello, very good morning, and thanks so much for joining us here on The Breakfast Show. Our top story here this morning, the return of George Galloway. The veteran left-winger and pro-Palestinian campaigner has won the Rochdale by-election. He said in his victory speech, Keir Starmer, this is for Gaza, and announced that he wants to stand 50 candidates in the general election. There was no official Labour candidate in what was a chaotic campaign after Labour withdrew its support for Azhar Ali in a row over anti-Semitism. Well, Mr Galloway received 12,335 votes, giving him a majority of nearly 6,000. An independent candidate came second, beating the Tories who came in third. And Labour's disavowed candidate was fourth. That means the vote share looks like this. George Galloway's Workers' Party of Britain got 39.7% and no one else came close. Our chief political correspondent, John Craig, reports from Rochdale. George Galloway is duly... A stunning Commons comeback by George Galloway and Keir Starmer's worst nightmare. Keir Starmer, this is for Gaza. You have paid, and you will pay, a high price for the role that you have played in enabling, encouraging, and covering for the catastrophe presently going on in occupied Palestine in the Gaza Strip. Then from the count, Mr Galloway headed back to his campaign HQ to address his jubilant supporters. There are thousands of people here whose hearts are breaking over what's happening in Gaza. The candidate Labour disowned over his comments on Israel, Azhar Ali, came fourth behind an independent and the Conservatives. And another former Labour MP, Reform UK candidate Simon Danchuk, came a humiliating sixth, prompting his party leader to accuse opponents of dirty tricks. Our candidate has suffered vile, racist abuse and death threats. Our staff have been intimidated. We've had to move them from accommodation. We've had to engage security guards. Our business supporters have been threatened with being firebombed. <laughs> While Mr Galloway's win was widely predicted, a surprise was independent David Tully coming second, well ahead of the established political parties. I wanted to really try and break the mould of um, Labour, Tories, and, and that's what I feel we've achieved in the last four weeks. With Sir Keir already under fire from the left of his party and the SNP on Gaza ceasefire calls, Mr Galloway's election in what was a safe Labour seat is a disaster. The work starts on Monday. And Mr Galloway now hopes to field up to 50 pro-Palestine candidates in the general election, with the aim of inflicting more damage on Labour. John Craig, Sky News, Rochdale. 
So Rob's here, and Rob, an emphatic victory there for George Galloway. So just how much of a headache is this for Keir Starmer? Look, this has been a mess for Labour, no two ways about it. The former Labour candidate now pushed into fourth place. I think the scale of George Galloway's win here, though, does beg the question that even if um, Azhar Ali, or even if there had been a Labour candidate endorsed by the party there, would he have still taken it? Look, I think this does highlight Gaza, Middle East policy as a continuing weak spot, a vulnerable spot, a vulnerability um, for Labour. It was something that George Galloway campaigned on um, heavily, and you can expect him to be focusing on that and Keir Starmer's stance on a ceasefire in Gaza when he reaches Parliament. And is there a kind of read across for the general election from this result, or is it seen as a, a, a bit of a one-off? No, this is quite unique, and I think this is the, the sort of big caveat here that will um, kind of give that will make Labour a little less depressed about all of this this morning, if you like. George Galloway is quite a unique circumstance wherever he decides to campaign. We have seen him do this before in by-elections. Clearly, there were low, a lot of unique circumstances around the Labour campaign and the candidates um, in this seat. Ultimately, the general election is not going to be decided on issues like the Rochdale by-election was decided on. It's going to be decided on cost of living, it's going to be decided on the NHS and on issues around migration. Those are the big factors. So whilst, yes, it's worrying that George Galloway is talking about putting 50 candidates up in certain seats that might eat into some Labour votes and take some Labour votes away on the back of concerns over Gaza, but has it substantially set Labour off their stride towards the general election? I don't think so. Does the Conservatives take anything from this or do they just let Rochdale sweep by them and focus on other bigger issues for the party? I think so. I think it's probably one of those rare by-election Friday mornings where we're not talking about an utter disaster for the Conservatives. So I think given some of the results they've had in places like Wellingsborough and Kingswood, they'll take that. None of the big parties did well, did they? No. No. Um, we'll get Labour's reaction uh, shortly. In the meantime, what else is around today? We're going to turn our attention to Germany because the trial of Christian B, the main suspect in the disappearance of Madeleine McCann, resumes in Germany today. The 47-year-old is facing three counts of rape and two for sexual abuse of children, while our crime correspondent Martin Brunt is outside the court for us. Uh, Martin, tell us more about this trial. Well, this will be a big day potentially because uh, what we're going to hear is evidence from a man who appears to be a key witness against Christian B, a man called, a German guy called Manfred Seyferth, uh, who has already given evidence against Christian B uh, five years ago in his rape trial here. Uh, Christian B is currently serving a seven year sentence for rape. And Manfred Seyferth, a former friend of his, um, who said some pretty unpleasant things about Christian B in the past, uh, will give evidence today. We've seen him wandering up and down the street. Uh, there was no confirmation that he would be here, but we've seen him now. Uh, we're expecting fireworks because the key part of his evidence is that he says that he found uh, a videotape at the home of Christian B in which he says he saw Christian B filming himself raping uh, two women, an elderly woman and a teenage girl. And that evidence forms part of the evidence against Christian B over two of the five charges, the sex crimes charges he's facing here. Now, nobody has ever seen these tapes. The authorities have never found them. So Christian B's defence lawyer is bound to give this witness a very hard time. He will question his motives. He'll say he's a petty criminal. Why should the judges believe him? But it also question uh, the very existence of those tapes that Manfred Seyforth says he saw, but the authorities, the police investigators, have never recovered. Martin, for the moment, thank you. The National Audit Office has warned that the cost of the government's Rwanda scheme could reach almost half a billion pounds. The money sent to Rwanda over the next two years takes the total to 370 million. Another 120 million will be paid once the first 300 people have been deported. The Shadow Home Secretary says the findings are shocking. This scheme will cost the taxpayer over half a billion pounds just to send 300 people to Rwanda. That is less than 1% of those arriving in the country. It's a cost of about £2 million per person. This is a shocking revelation in this report that they've tried to hide. We should be investing that money in boosting our border security, in going after the criminal smuggler gangs instead. 
The funeral of the Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny will take place in Moscow this morning. Security is expected to be tight, many fearing a police crackdown on the event. The ceremony will be held in a church in Marino where Navalny used to live. Now, there's been condemnation of Israel after more than 100 people were killed in Gaza while trying to receive humanitarian aid. Well, let's cross live now to our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkle, who's in Jerusalem for us this morning. Um, and, Alistair, two sides have different accounts of, of this incident. So, how clear are we about what happened? Well, we're not clear, to be honest, beyond the fact that what happened was clearly you know, very, very tragic and resulted in the deaths of many people, uh, more than 100, according to the health ministry in Gaza, and hundreds were wounded as well. The reason we're not clear is because there is a differing version of events. The Palestinians say that they were fired upon by the Israeli Defence Forces. Uh, the Israeli Defence Forces say that what actually happened was that there was a stampede around the aid convoy uh, and during that, people were, were trampled. Um, the drivers of the trucks accidentally ran some people over. But the IDF has admitted that some of its soldiers did open fire because they say that the soldiers felt that they were under threat, that their security was at risk. And the other complicating factor in all this is that it was dark, it was before dawn. And so um, trying to find any documentary evidence to um, you know, come to a, a firm conclusion as to what happened one way or the other is, is very tricky indeed. And, and you do have these two versions of events. And I think that is why the Americans last night didn't back a statement in the UN Security Council uh, condemning Israel, because they say they, they simply don't know yet what, what the truth is. And I think that, you know, there is an element um, of, of sense in that. But at the same time, the Americans are becoming clearly increasingly frustrated with Israel. They are not happy with the high civilian death toll, which passed 30,000 yesterday. They're not happy with the very low levels of aid that's being allowed into Gaza. And they will not be happy with what happened yesterday around that aid convoy when uh, so many people were killed. Alistair, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Well, with over a million people still trapped in southern Gaza ahead of the threatened Israeli invasion, one Egyptian company is making millions from Palestinians who are desperate to escape. After taking complete control of the process known as coordination, essentially an institutionalised system of bribes, the company has increased payments from 350 to over $5,000. Sky's Tom Cheshire has more. Even from this remote aerial view, almost like an X-ray, you can feel the desperation of Palestinians. Trying to get food, crowding the trucks bringing it, finding death instead. Dozens of people were killed here near Gaza City, a shocking loss of life, its cause disputed by both sides. It is yet another reason why, here on the ground, people are so desperate to leave. A tent city that grows with each family that arrives here. Rafa on the border with Egypt. No one wants to be here. But there is a way out. It is one that Amani, not her real name, and her children are trying to seek. But a Sky News investigation can reveal how one Egyptian company controls that crossing and that they've increased their prices 14-fold since the start of the war, earning more than $1 million each day from the refugees of Rafa. One former industry insider said he quit his job because of the price hikes, telling us, quote, I refuse to partake in the crime of these prices and the extortion. That leaves Armani and hundreds of thousands of people like her trapped in Gaza. Life is hard and it's a big responsibility without a father to raise five kids. Maybe if the price goes down, he can take us out, but it's not possible. God willing, the price will go down. Officially, Egypt and Israel only allow the exit of foreign nationals and injured evacuees. In reality, though, there's a third option. And this is what it looks like before the war. It's a Halla advert for travel across the border, a list known as coordination. More than half the people who leave Gaza now get out this way. Based on social media posts and the testimony of dozens of people who've arranged travel with Halla since October the 7th, Sky News was able to piece together a clear picture of how the company operates. Tickets used to cost in the region of $350, around £280 before the war. 
but Haller price lists show people are now looking at $5,000 per person to guarantee a way out, and $2,500 for children. Passenger lists are released daily, sometimes pictures taken of paper sheets posted on social media. On average, 235 people travel a day. Some passengers with Egyptian nationality pay a lower fare. But Sky News analysis of Hala crossing lists and prices shows that on a day with few Egyptian passengers, the company can earn in excess of $1 million. Sky News asked Egypt's foreign minister about the money being made by Hala transferring Palestinians across his border. We do not condone it and we will uh, take whatever measures uh, that we need to so as to uh, restrict it and eliminate it totally. There, there should be no uh, advantage taken out of this situation uh, for monetary gain. Human Rights Watch told us that statement rang false, that there's no way Halle could operate without the say-so of the Egyptian military. We put that allegation back to the Egyptian government, but we didn't receive a reply. And Halle itself did not respond to any of our requests for comment. <laughs> For all the talk of ceasefire, Israel is still committed to one final ground assault in Rafah. And Amani and her children are stuck. We're always flirting with wars, always bombing. There's no safety. Our ambitions are for the war to end, for our lives to return. But there is no immediate prospect of that return, nor of fleeing this place. The cost is just too much. Everyone's fear is that the cost of not being able to pay may finally prove higher. Tom Cheshire, Sky News. Now, MPs have called for a fresh review into evidence for those who suffered avoidable harm from the use of the controversial pregnancy test drug, Primados. Uh, well, our home editor, Jason Farrell, is here with me, and you've done a lot of investigations and reports on just this subject. So what is this latest development, then? Well, this is a group of MPs who are saying that a report that was used by the government and the manufacturer in court to strike out a claim by a group of disabled families um, was flawed. This report was flawed. Just to explain, Primados, it's a drug that was taken by women back in the 60s and 70s um, as a pregnancy test, and many women feel that it led to malformations, a bit like thalidomide, um, in the children after their babies were born. Um, they've been campaigning for many, many years, um, and this particular report, which was produced in 2017, essentially said there wasn't a link between Primados and malformations. And what the MP says, actually, they, they draw on several bits of evidence, including scientists from Oxford who say that the report was done in the wrong way, new evidence that's come forward since, and also the way in which the report was pulled together. Um, they're calling it a cover-up. They say, you know, this is, a, this is potentially one of the biggest medical frauds of the 20, uh, 20th century. Um, and I think what's really important to mention here is when we see all the tribal nature within politics, we see all the battlegrounds in, in the Commons and in by-elections, this is a group of cross-party MPs. So you've got uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg from the Conservatives, you've got um, Yasmin Qureshi from Labour, you've got Hannah Burrell from the SNP, Ed Davey from the Liberal Democrats, all coming together and saying the government needs to shift on this, they're calling it a scandal, and they need to actually try and help these people and make sure that the evidence is reassessed mm. so that um, these people can get justice. Yeah, a push, a push across the party. I should That's say, of course, that the manufacturer of the drug says that uh, there's no evidence of uh, an association between the drug and malformations. OK, Jason, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Now, let's get more on our top story and the return of George Galloway, who's won the Rochdale by-election overnight. <laughs> Well, the seat was previously held by Labour, but their campaign was thrown into disarray by leaked recordings of their candidate, Asar Ali, making alleged anti-Semitic comments. The party withdrew its support from Mr Ali, but it was too late to remove his name from the ballot paper. And in yesterday's vote, he came in fourth, winning 2,402 votes. Well, in his victory speech, George Galloway said Keir Starmer is on notice and the vote was for Gaza. Well, let's get Labour's reaction to that uh, overnight success by uh, George Galloway. Labour's Deputy National Campaign Coordinator, Ellie Reeves, is here with me. Very good morning to morning. you. Uh, how do you feel about George Galloway winning in Rochdale? Well, look, Labour regrets that we couldn't stand uh, a candidate in this by-election. And we apologise to the people of Rochdale for that. Um, George Galloway is someone who stokes up division and fear in this 
uh, isn't how we would have wanted this by-election to play out. But as you said, uh, the Labour candidate uh, was removed uh, as the candidate uh, because of comments that he made. Keir Starmer took swift and decisive action to do that because being a Labour candidate requires uh, the highest of uh, standards. It was a bit of a farce for Labour, wasn't it? Who did you want to win? Well, look, you know, that was for the people of Rochdale to decide. Yeah, but who, who would but... Labour have liked to have seen win this seat? I think that's for the people of Rochdale to decide. They made that decision uh, last night. Uh, we didn't want this by-election uh, to turn out the way that it did, in the sense that we removed support from our candidates. It's unprecedented for uh, a leader to withdraw, to, to not field uh, a candidate in a by-election in this way, but it was the right thing to do because of those comments. You know, the Labour Party has changed under Keir Starmer. There is zero tolerance to anti-Semitism and indeed to Islamophobia and any other form of racism, which is why the, the, the action uh, was taken uh, in this by-election. But, you know, we regret we couldn't have a candidate and we do apologise to people of Rochdale. The thing for us now is uh, that we need to select a candidate for the general election, someone that will be able to unite communities uh, across uh, Rochdale and be a strong uh, voice for, for Labour there. Well, that will be an interesting moment, won't it? I mean, George Galloway won by a huge majority, nearly 6,000. I mean, there's a chance he would have beaten a Labour candidate without the controversies, isn't there? Well, we can't really talk about hypotheticals. You know, we've had by-elections a couple of weeks ago in Wellingborough and Kingswood, where, for example, uh, we saw uh, the second highest swing to Labour in any post-war by-election in uh, Wellingborough. So, you know, we didn't have a candidate, so uh, it's really difficult to say what would happen if we did. But, you know, we do know that... Uh, that, that, that it isn't, you know, how we would have wanted things to, to, to play out. But, but you're confident important. the seat will go back to Labour at the general election? Look, we, we, we fight for every vote. We're not complacent about uh, anything. We weren't complacent uh, about the uh, votes in the recent successful by-elections in Wellingborough and Kingswood uh, and uh, Tamworth and Mid-Beds in the autumn. We won't take any vote for granted at the general election. You know, we're a changed Labour Party. We've got a strong vision for the country after 14 years of Conservative failure, uh, but we're not complacent about everything, anything. George Galloway sent a, a defiant, angry message to Keir Starmer. He said that... Uh, the Labour leader, will pay a high price for his stance on Gaza. Do you think that stance could lose you other seats come a general election? Well, we've set out our position on uh, Gaza, uh, and that was adopted by the, the Commons uh, just, uh, just the other week. You know, we've said there should be uh, an immediate humanitarian ceasefire that the loss of life has been intolerable. There must be no ground offensive in Rafa. Aid has to be ramped up into the uh, region. And importantly, that we need to find a two-state solution. And that shouldn't just be sort of empty words by politicians, but a political reality rather than an aspiration. Uh, and, you know, a, a Labour government would work tirelessly to make sure that happens. As you know, there are plenty of people that want that position toughened up. Will Labour look at it again, or is this how it's going to stay? We've set out our position. We've called for that immediate humanitarian uh, ceasefire that's in line with international partners in Australia, New Zealand and uh, Canada and it's something that we're pushing hard for. Um, I know that you wanted to talk about um, the economy and particularly the economy in the north today so let's just touch on that because a study has come out from um, the think tank the IPPR which has found that the the north faces decades of lower healthy life expectancy uh, compared to the southeast. How concerned are you by that? And what would a Labour government do about it? I'm really concerned by, by that. And, you know, for all this government's talk of levelling uh, up, that simply hasn't been the reality. And uh, people in the North uh, are left uh, worse off. That's why we have set out a plan for growth for every region and nation across the country with our National Wealth Fund investing in the industries of the future, uh, electric vehicle manufacturing, uh, carbon capture and storage, basically being able to get the growth growth that has been desperately lacking over the last 14 years, but also making sure that the everyday economy uh, pays. So our new deal for working people, banning um, zero hours contracts and the practice of hire and refire. These things are really, really important across the country, but particularly in the north where uh, so many people work in that everyday precarious economy. Uh, I also want to ask you about the upcoming budget uh, next Wednesday, of course. Um, the Conservatives are now talking about exploring the option of scrapping the non-DOM tax status. Uh, people who live in the UK but whose home for tax purposes is abroad. One of Labour's favourite policies. How do you feel about that? 
Well, you know, I'm not going to speculate on what may or may not be in the the, the budget. You know, Jeremy Hunt's giving a bit but of a would you running comment, commentary. The we, 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 we've we've, 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 we've been for. calling to end non-dom status for uh, some time, uh, and if the government do go ahead and do that, it, it's yet another uh, policy uh, of Labour's that uh, the government is adopting, just like the windfall uh, tax on the uh, energy uh, companies, um, just like our dental uh, plan. It's a government that's out of ideas after 14 years. So, you know, if you run out of ideas, call the general election. But if they did uh, introduce this policy, they would no doubt use it to fund tax cuts. Uh, Labour, on the other hand, has said that they would use the money to go into to the likes of, of schools and, and the health service. So what does that mean of, in terms of your spending pledges? If the government introduces this, would you stick with it and keep those tax cuts that they've introduced? Well, I'm not going to speculate about what may or may not happen next week. We've been here before where promises have been uh, made uh, and then actually uh, you know, it hasn't been followed through with announcements. So I'm not sure there's much point speculating uh, ahead of the budget next week. Obviously, we'll be looking at it very closely. What I would say, though, is that all of Labour's policies will be fully costed. We saw what happened with Liz Truss's mini-budget where uh, it led the markets in freefall. People are still paying uh, higher uh, rates on their mortgages, uh, hundreds of pounds more each month because of the damage that budget did to the, uh, the, the, the economy. That's why it's crucial that everything is fully costed and that would happen under a Labour government. OK, well, we'll let you go. But before we go, do you want to say a quick word of congratulations to George Galloway this morning? I think we'll leave it there. OK, well, Eddie Rees, we appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, let's take a quick look at what the weather's up to now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, today marks the start of the meteorological spring, but heavy rain will keep the flood risk while snow will affect some hills. It's cold out there now, with rain, sleet and hill snow moving across England, Wales and Ireland. Britain will turn more showery in the south through the morning as the rain, sleet and hill snow clears into central parts, perhaps affecting Northern Ireland too. Meanwhile, Ireland will see the wintry weather becoming confined to the south and east. Elsewhere, Scotland will be largely fine, but the far northwest will be wet. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Still to come here on The Breakfast Show, can the UN answer America's plea to help alleviate the world's worst humanitarian crisis? We'll hear from their refugee agency next. And we've got the sport coming up for you as well, as Lewis Hamilton and Mercedes provide the shocks on the track in practice for the season-opening Bahrain Grand Prix.
We're going to have all the latest on the situation in Sudan in a moment. But, Rob, I just wanted to reflect quickly on what um, we heard Ellie Reeves for Labour there saying about the Rochdale by-election, which has not been their finest moment, has it? Yeah, a difficult morning for Labour. I think Ellie Reeves probably did um, about as good as any Labour spokesperson could do um, this morning, not answering the question of who Labour will have wanted to win there. Clearly, they didn't have a candidate up, um, but saying that, you know, now it was about selecting someone for the general election. Um, I thought the one takeaway in, in policy terms from that, and I don't think we should have expected this anyway, but she confirmed that they won't be looking again at the policy on Gaza and the ceasefire, the policy of calling for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire remains. So I don't think there's going to be any sort of introspection and pulling apart policies in response to this one by-election result. I think the reason for that, as we were talking about earlier, is that there are a lot of unique circumstances around this. So I'm not sure this is necessarily a sort of big trend. It's quite a one-off. She mentioned about that policy being adopted by the Commons with regards to the ceasefire on Gaza, but said it with a straight face, considering the farce that surrounded that as well. Yeah, I think to try and claim that the sort of Commons came together mm. in some sort of show of unity around the Labour position on Gaza is probably um, a stretch. I mean, on paper, she's correct. But I don't think it will be long until we get another sort of parliamentary moment or the opposition, the other parties, find a way to sort of try and lever open those divisions on Gaza that exist within Labour, because they are there, and what this by-election proves is that it's difficult territory for Labour or Middle East policy. Difficult territory now, if they win the next election and they become a government, it'll still be difficult territory then as well. Should we remind you of the top story this morning? Yeah, do it. Unsurprisingly, George Galloway has won the Rochdale by-election, securing 40% of the vote. The veteran pro-Palestinian campaigner began his speech with a message to the Labour leader, saying, Keir Starmer, this is for Gaza. The Secretary-General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, has led calls for an investigation into the killing of more than 100 people in Gaza who were trying to receive aid. Israel has denied it deliberately targeted the convoy. The National Audit Office has warned that the cost of the government's Rwanda asylum scheme could soar to £500 million. The Home Office has refused to say how much more money, on top of the £290 million already confirmed, that the UK has agreed to pay to Kigali. And obesity is now a greater threat to global health than hunger. That's the warning from scientists who say more than a billion people worldwide are now obese, including nearly 160 million children. Now, the United States has urged the UN to help bring an end to the fighting which has divided Sudan for almost a year. Almost 25 million people, or half the country's population, is now in need of aid. Well, let's hear from the Deputy High Commissioner of the UN's Refugee Agency now, Kelly Clemens. Uh, a very good morning to you, Kelly Clemens. Thanks so much for talking to us. I wonder if, first of all, you can give us an idea of what the situation is like there. I know that you've been at the Sudanese border uh, since refugees from the war began arriving there. So, describe the situation on the ground. Yes, thank you. I'm, I was just in the last couple of days at the Sudan-Chad border. I'm in Anjamita now in the capital of Chad. Um, the situation at the border is very different, of course, than a few months ago when we had thousands of people that were fleeing every day, primarily women and children, about 90% of the refugee population. Many of the men either have perished or have been left behind. Um, this is a situation that's very dire. Chad had already received about 400,000 refugees in the last two decades, um, and about 700,000 came to Chad in the last 10 months, of which about 550,000 are refugees. Inside Sudan, we're talking about close to 15 million people in need of everything, water, food, uh, the basics. And this is the where I am right now, as closest to West Darfur. There are about 1.1 million people inside that are on the edge of severe hunger um, and a large number of being children. Uh, the UN and the partners, of course, are trying to work around the clock to be able to access uh, populations that have largely been cut off, trying to bring uh, resources in any way that we can. This has been extremely difficult, especially from Chad, where I am, uh, with the cross-border at the moment being suspended. How would you sum up the scale of this crisis? It's one of the worst in the world. This is a, a situation that is largely not covered, so thank you, Sky News. Um, this is a situation that now has displacement exceeding 8 million. We're not even to a one-year anniversary of this brutal and senseless conflict. And this is something that has really ravaged populations. The stories we heard, including the stories in the last couple of days in Adre uh, at the Chad border, are harrowing. Um, women have been raped, sexual violence, 
uh, children, of course, uh, seeing uh, unspeakable uh, atrocities. And this is something that is not just the basic needs that we need to try to provide, but it's the psychological wounds of war. And what about the impact on neighbouring countries with people trying to get out of Sudan? How much are those countries able to, to, to cope and able to support them? Well, Chad, where I am, is really quite, has been quite an extraordinary uh, hospitable host. 20 years now, uh, 20 years ago, the first wave of refugees came into Chad. They have almost nothing themselves. Services are very limited. Resources are limited. The place where we were, we were uh, there at the border, very remote. So it's difficult for Chad Chadians to make ends meet. It's even more difficult for refugees to make, and make ends meet. Uh, in this situation, we've got 1.6 million Sudanese since last April who have uh, sought safety in neighboring countries. And these are countries that have kept their borders open, including Chad, including with regard to the instability there at the border. Uh, it may be closed for everything else, but for people, what I heard from Chadians and from the local authorities and the government is that they are determined to keep the borders open to their brothers and sisters of Sudan. And how much aid is getting in and how much more is needed? How concerned are you about the levels of aid and, and, and perhaps international attention that this is getting? Well, very little international attention. We have uh, resource requirements uh, for Sudan specifically of $2.7 billion. Uh, less than 10% has been supported. There's a regional refugee response plan for uh, those neighbors that we've just talked about, which is about 1.4 billion. Only 4% has been subscribed. We are extremely concerned about our ability to be able to both get aid in, but also to reach populations in need because of the way that the conflict is moving. Um, and the lack of guarantees that we have for safe passage, both for humanitarian workers or, frankly, to be able to reach those people who want to move. Um, so both. We, have, we, are, we are stuck at, in both directions. Um, we need to get more aid in. We have been able to, from the Chad side, get about 11,000 metric tons in. But again, that uh, cross-border operation for the moment has been suspended. We have to, to work from every angle in order to bring in food bring in uh, clean water, bring in the basics for people to be able to survive. OK, well, Kelly Clements uh, from the UNHCR, we appreciate you talking to us today, uh, live from Chad there for us. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this next story might sound quite surprising, having just heard uh, from what's going on um, there in Sudan. But um, another big concern is about obesity in the world. Obesity is now a greater threat to global health than hunger, according uh, to scientists who are saying that more than a billion people are obese. Well, Molly's here with a closer look at those numbers. And this does sound strange when we're just talking about people really struggling with issues of hunger. But in, in that kind of bigger context, obesity clearly a big health concern as well globally. Yeah, they've taken this in the context of 190 uh, countries between data between 1990 and 2022. And in that data, they found over those period of years, a quadrupling of uh, levels and rates of obesity uh, in children and more than double rates between those years in adults. So really quite stark uh, data. Now, some of the Pacific Island nations were most heavily affected. So you've got American, uh, Samoa, Tonga. In those countries, you've got rates of 60, 70, 80 percent of obesity. But in the UK, they had some quite stark findings as well, and they rank pretty highly in that global order. They found 16.8 million people in the UK were considered to be obese, which included 760,000 boys, children, and 590,000 girls. Now, in terms of what they deem as to be living with obesity, people might be wondering. Well, in adults, that's, that's considered a BMI, a body mass index, of above 30. But I think some of the factors as to what they say is causing it is quite interesting. They point to some of it relating to access and the cost of food, so pointing to things like the, the war in Ukraine having an impact on the, our ability to access certain nutrients, certain foods, as easily as we might have been in, in previous years, and also climate change, but clearly also pointing to physical habits and the importance of uh, exercise, as you, as you might expect. Now, NHS England have 
responded, saying that the figures, unsurprisingly, are alarming. But they do stress that this isn't an issue that the health service can solve. And actually, it's a societal issue that we need to look at improving, uh, think, improving our exercise and our eating habits ourselves, really. And we can't be relying on structures like the health service to solve it. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? Because it's one of those issues that I think everyone knows that yeah. it's not healthy and yet changing people's habits is, is such a tricky issue and plenty of people have tried. It takes yeah. time. It does, yes. yeah. Molly, thanks very much indeed. Uh, let's just show you some live pictures now from Moscow. Uh, this is the church where the funeral of the opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, will take place later on today. Uh, his family and supporters have accused the Kremlin of delaying the handover of his body and blackmailing them into agreeing a private funeral. And it's unclear whether the authorities will allow mourners to gather freely. Um, it's a subject that we're going to return to in the next few minutes, but just to set the scene for you, that that a funeral expected to go on the go ahead on the outskirts of Moscow later on today. But we've got the sport coming up with Eleanor in a moment, and uh, it's all happening as far as Formula One is concerned. Yeah, isn't it? on lots of different levels. You're right. Lots to talk about season opener, but also lots happening off the track. So we'll give you all the sport that's coming up next. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. Now, this signifies a corner, OK? I don't want this and I don't want that. I need the hand up here, OK? That is contested. It's school on a Sunday but nobody's complaining because the lesson is the laws of the game and the classroom is Villa Park. The FA wants to find 1,000 new black, Asian and mixed heritage referees from different communities around the country. It's part of the reflective and representative campaign. We want to increase the pool of referees from these communities at a grassroots level with the hope that in the future that these individuals can then go through the referee and progression pathway and then eventually uh, referee within the Women's Super League and in the Premier League. Historically, maybe the interest wasn't there, but actually we haven't probably done enough to ac actually showcase what refereeing is about. You're going to go there and blow, blow the whistle and give a direct free kick. A lot of challenges that people talked about, the themes were, you know, referee courses were too expensive. Um, and that's why we've employed a bursary scheme as part of this campaign. You two go. Going into grassroots football and going into it as a referee, um, with all the other challenges that I have, uh, the other added challenge will be um, the, the, the discrimination angle. You need to blow the whistle and put your hand like this. It's got to be like this on every single cone. The achievements of Sam Allison, Rebecca Welsh and Sunny Singil have highlighted the importance of role models and mentors within refereeing, with new refs coming through having people to aspire to. The organisation BAMREF was set up to increase levels of representation in refereeing and we're in attendance on the day. Straight arm out. Well, I've never seen this before. It's absolutely amazing to be part of a room full of young, black, Asian, mixed heritage uh, young people ready to start their refereeing journey. Do you remember when you first stepped into a room ready to do a referee call? I was the only female and I was the only black and Asian uh, mixed heritage of that community. To see this happening right now, this is what we need. We need people to feel that they belong in refereeing. And we're going to stop, blow and give a penalty. Yeah, still got it there. What I'm really, really um, so pleased to, about today is the fact that we've got a huge, wide, wide range, young 16-year-olds all the way up to adults really 12 years ago it was literally I walked into the room and it was a room full of about 45 people and I was the only person of color when you look at the makeup of the football clubs the players themselves they, there's a very wide diverse background but actually onto the field of play as the officials no there isn't over 200 people accessed the bursary scheme between September and January with more to be added across 13 courses over February Referee courses can cost up to £140, but were lowered to 40 this time round. I want to broaden my knowledge in football and um, in future I wish to have a full-time career in football in some aspect, whether that's refereeing, coaching or whatever, but um, I just want to be involved in football because I love the game. What I like about refing is that you don't have to be a great player or anything, 
it's just about showing your leadership skills and also enjoying the game alongside the players. I'm enjoying how it's like teaching people in independence and things, and I, I quite like. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Still to come here on The Breakfast Show, ahead of Alexei Navalny's funeral today, we'll be asking whether the protests that have followed will actually lead to any change. Spencer and I'm Sky News's arts and entertainment correspondent. As a team we've interviewed some of the biggest stars in the world, the likes of Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, Sir Elton John. We try to give you an honest sense of how these people really are. I'm Martin Brunt and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. My most memorable story was, and still is, the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Please, please do not hurt her. Please give our little girl back. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. For detectives, the first 48 hours after a murder are crucial in the search for clues. The public expects them to find Jill Dando's killer soon. I remember the grimmest case, the Soham murders of schoolgirls Holly and Jessica. I felt I can't undo what's happened, but I can help explain it. <laughs> Ian Huntley was arrested and charged within a fortnight of the murders. My biggest challenge was to persuade a jail diamond thief to answer my letters. Martin Brunt, Sky News, at the Old Bailey. Hello, welcome back to The Breakfast Show. Coming up, we'll be telling you what's caught our eye in this morning's papers. But first, the funeral service for Alexei Navalny, the fierce critic of President Vladimir Putin, will be held later on today in Moscow. Navalny died last month while serving out a sentence at the remote Polar Wolf Penal Colony. Well, let's hear now from Dmitry Moskovsky, a PR coordinator of the Russian Democratic Society, which helped organise protests over Navalny's death. As you can see, he's here with me. Very good morning to you. Thanks so much for coming in. Uh, we saw those shots just now of the church where this funeral service will take place later on today. How much do we know about what form it's going to take? So, as we know, for now on, um, it's going to be the formal farewell of Alexei because his body was given uh, just a few days ago to his mother from the Salahart, the city like super north in Russia. As we know from now on, we probably they probably won't allow too many people inside the church. They'll just <coughs> probably keep them outside. Inside, I think, it's going to be his mother, and that's probably all. And, and not his wife, he's, he's... Yeah, his wife is outside of Russia. His mm -hmm. wife is, as I'm aware of, is in Germany. 
or maybe in another place now. I'm not sure where they're based. But yeah, I don't think she's going to attend it to the, in any way because it's just too dangerous. As she said, that she's going to keep on with the work, with the mission of Alexei Navalny after his death. And there are calls for supporters to go to attend. Do you think many people will go and how much of a risk would they be taking if they did turn up? I mean, when we're talking about Russia, we're always talking about almost totalitarian regime. And uh, there is a risk. There is always a risk. We've seen people being arrested uh, just for the farewell at the first day when uh, people wanted to put uh, flowers, not even to any places related to Alexei, just places related to the victims of political rep repressions. And we've seen that. So we never know where it's going to end up. It may be uh, mass arrests. It might be just few people might be arrested, but yeah. We've certainly seen that there are, there appear to be quite a lot of security around um, that church al already today with the, with the funeral some hours off. Um, you've been involved in organising protests in the aftermath of uh, Navalny's death here in London, haven't you? What did you want to try to achieve with that? I mean, our main, our main mission as a community, as a Russian Democratic Society in here, is to bring people together is to give them idea that uh, you, we still can be united, that we can still uh, stay together and we can still express our ideas and address them to UK government, to UK people, so they all understand that, that Russian people are not all the same and that the people who are super pro-war, super pro-Putin is a minority, in fact. And we are in the majority, and I mean like uh, Russian people inside Russia and outside Russia want to live the usual European life. It's quite the same for all of the, for all of the people, what they, what they dream about and what they want to achieve in life. How, how difficult is it to know how people feel in, in Russia when they might feel constrained to express an opinion? They might be worried about it. How, how do you know how much support Navalny had, for example? Of course, when we're talking about Russia, again, we're talking about almost a totalitarian regime with a mass propaganda based on people and that people are always struggling to uh, express what they think, as you said. And uh, in fact, we never know how many people exactly support Navalny or have opposition views because there are no, um, there are no surveys made by, like, um, by uh, sociological surveys. There are no there is no way to just understand the amount of people who support it, who support Navalny or support the war. What are the chances now of an opposition movement in Russia? When we're talking about opposition movement, uh, we're always talking about the potential. We never know where, when it's exactly going to be. Uh, so, uh, and I mean, with the, with the opposition movement, it's always difficult to say when it's going to be now or later on, or it's ne never going to happen. But what we can do actually now is just to stay united, is just to express uh, what we think and still will work with the uh, UK government, with European, with European governments, with the US government to help people who left Russia due to war, who left Ukraine due to war. Uh, we're initiating humanitarian projects for the Ukraine. We're initiating humanitarian projects for Russian political activists. And I mean, that's the thing which we can, um, which we can do here and which we're doing and just our mission is still going to be the same and we're still going to keep working on, even after Alexis. OK, well, Dmitry Moskovsky, we really appreciate you coming in telling us a little bit about your work. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a look at what the weather's doing now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, today marks the start of the meteorological spring, but heavy rain will keep the flood risk, while snow will affect some hills. It's cold out there now, with rain, sleet and hill snow moving across England, Wales and Ireland. Uh, Britain will turn more showery in the south through the morning as the rain, sleet and hill snow clears into central parts, perhaps affecting Northern Ireland too. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. So we thought we'd take a look at uh, some of the stories that we've picked out of the papers now. And yeah, Gareth, you're going to kick us off, aren't you? Picking up really from your interview just yeah. then, uh, this is in the eye, referencing those comments by Vladimir Putin with regards to a nuclear war with the West and just making, making parallels to uh, Nazis' invasion of Russia and also Napoleon Bonaparte's invasion of Russia, warning the West, if you try and enter our country, look what's happened before. Uh, and 1812, of course. So lots of, lots of focus on that. And I think the West always needs to remember with people like Putin, 
is that election cycles don't affect him because he's got that iron grip on the country. So he can play the long game. We've seen that, obviously, in Ukraine. We've seen that in Georgia and Abkhazia and South Ossetia. We've seen that to a degree. Transnistria and Moldova. So uh, a warning from him, but I think the bigger warning is he's not going anywhere. So look beyond the pork barrel and party politics of four-year cycles, because he certainly does. Yeah, and, and he, he came over as pretty confident in his, mm. this annual address, didn't he, yesterday? Bombastic. He just spoke for a couple of hours. Um, he, he obviously feels that things are going his way in Ukraine. Um, very different subject that I spotted in today's Guardian, um, and this is about a boom in book clubs amongst young people. Amazing. Amongst Generation Z, and I'm, I'm so off Generation Z that I can't even remember how old people in Generation Z. Are you Generation Z? I don't know. I don't know. Are you a millennial? I think, I think, it's, I think it's up to about I 27. Think. 30s, yeah. God knows what I am. <laughs> really don't want to think about that. But it's really interesting, I think. Apparently, there are some celebrity book clubs. People like, I think it's Dua Lipa has got a book club. But it's also a movement away yeah. from clubs. Well, all the stats show you're sort of far less likely to drink, far more likely yeah. to be teetotal if you're younger now. I know, and With reading the, books. The sourdough generation. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I've never been. Yeah. I've never been invited to a book club. I've always been rather offended. <laughs> Top stories next. Hello, very good morning. It's eight o'clock. Coming up on today's show, an astonishing political comeback for George Galloway, who wins the Rochdale by-election. He said Sir Keir Starmer is on notice and it was a vote for Gaza. Labour told this programme it hadn't turned out the way they wanted. Plus, we'll hear about what MPs are calling one of the biggest medical frauds of the 20th century. It's Friday, the 1st of March.
I do hereby declare that George Galloway is duly... George Galloway is back, winning in Rochdale with more than 12,000 votes. Keir Starmer, this is for Gaza. Condemnation of Israel after more than 100 people are killed in Gaza while trying to receive humanitarian aid. A Sky News investigation reveals the company making millions from Gaza's misery and people desperate to get out. The National Audit Office warns that the cost of the government's Rwanda asylum scheme could soar to £500 million. A greater threat to global health than hunger, researchers say there are now more than one billion obese people worldwide. And in sport, Red Bull boss Christian Horner has dismissed what he calls anonymous speculation after alleged evidence in his misconduct investigation is leaked on the first day of the new Formula One season. Hello, very good morning, and thanks so much for joining us here on The Breakfast Show. Our top story this morning, the return of George Galloway. The veteran left-winger and pro-Palestinian campaigner has won the Rochdale by-election. He said in his victory speech, Keir Starmer, this is for Gaza, and announced that he wants to stand 50 candidates in the general election. There was no official Labour candidate in what was a chaotic campaign after the party withdrew its support for Azhar Ali in a row over anti-Semitism. Well, Mr Galloway received 12,335 votes, giving him a majority of nearly 6,000. An independent candidate came second, beating the Tories, who came in third. And then Labour's disavowed candidate came in fourth. And that means the vote share looks like this. George Galloway's Workers' Party of Britain got 39.7% and nobody else came close. Our chief political correspondent, John Craig, reports from Rochdale. George Galloway is Julie. A stunning Commons comeback by George Galloway and Keir Starmer's worst nightmare. Keir Starmer, this is for Gaza. You have paid and you will pay a high price for the role that you have played in enabling, encouraging and covering for the catastrophe presently going on in occupied Palestine in the Gaza Strip. Then from the count, Mr Galloway headed back to his campaign HQ to address his jubilant supporters. There are thousands of people here whose hearts are breaking over what's happening in Gaza. The candidate Labour disowned over his comments on Israel, Azhar Ali, came fourth behind an independent and the Conservatives. And another former Labour MP, Reform UK candidate Simon Danchuk, came a humiliating sixth, prompting his party leader to accuse opponents of dirty tricks. Our candidate has suffered vile, racist abuse and death threats. Our staff have been intimidated. We've had to move them from accommodation. We've had to engage security guards. Our business supporters have been threatened with being firebombed. While Mr Galloway's win was widely predicted, a surprise was independent David Tully coming second, well ahead of the established political parties. I wanted to really try and break the mould of um, Labour, Tories, and, and that's what I feel we've achieved in the last four weeks. With Sir Keir already under fire from the left of his party and the SNP on Gaza ceasefire calls, Mr Galloway's election in what was a safe Labour seat is a disaster. The work starts on Monday. And Mr Galloway now hopes to field up to 50 pro-Palestine candidates in the general election with the aim of inflicting more damage on Labour. John Craig, Sky News, Rochdale. So Rob's here, and Rob, a thumping win for George Galloway. So what are the implications for Labour? Yeah, an emphatic win, pushing the now disavowed Labour candidate into fourth place, a disaster for Labour. To be honest, the scale of George Galloway's win does make you question 
whether he might have taken this seat even if Labour had fielded a candidate with the backing of the party. I, I guess we'll never know, but I think that would have been arguably even more of a disaster for the party if he'd managed to beat an actual um, Labour candidate. I, I, I think it does a few things. The first thing is it clearly highlights the weak spot, the vulnerabilities that Labour still have over policy towards the Middle East and Gaza um, in particular. We didn't get a sense from Labour this morning, though, that this would lead to any kind of soul-searching over their current position on the war in Gaza for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. I think that um, is bluntly locked in now. It's probably more to do with where other countries and international allies are rather than what's gone on in Rochdale. But I think it was clear, listening to Labour's Deputy National Campaign Coordinator Ellie Reeves this morning when he spoke to her, that there is some regret, quite a lot of regret in the party, about how this has played out. Have a listen. Labour regrets that we couldn't stand uh, a candidate in this by-election and we apologise to the people of Rochdale for that. Um, George Galloway is someone who stokes up division and fear and this uh, isn't how we would have wanted this by-election to play out. But as you said, uh, the Labour candidate uh, was removed uh, as the candidate uh, because of comments that he made. Keir Starmer took swift and decisive action to do that because being a Labour candidate requires uh, the highest of uh, standards. The big question always with general elections is what does this mean nationally? How does this translate to a general election? And with that in mind, Rochdale feels maybe a bit of an outlier rather than a national trend, surely? Absolutely. Like, when we're discussing by-election results, we always say, look, you can't read too much into what would happen at a general election. People vote differently. Now, that is especially the case here, because there was such a unique set of circumstances, the sort of chaotic Labour campaign, having to withdraw support. Wherever George Galloway campaigns and stands, it, it tends to be a unique case because he is such a unique politician in terms of he is a formidable campaigner and he does uh, latch on to certain issues in certain constituencies um, and uses them to his political advantage bluntly. We've seen him do it before in constituencies as well. So uh, I don't think we can read much, if anything, into what this means in a general election, certainly not compared to the sort of giant swings in support from Tory to Labour that allowed them to take other previous by-elections. So whilst, yes, they might be a bit worried about candidates being stood by George Galloway's party in other, in other seats at the general election, yes, they may take some support away, but as one pollster pointed out to you earlier, the seats where they have the most chance, seats where there are large Muslim populations, are also the safest Labour seats as well. So there aren't many of those Tory Labour marginals where George Galloway's party can really have an impact. So not a good night for Labour, an awkward morning. Has it set them off their stride in terms of the broader issues and their broader campaign around cost of living and the NHS towards the next general election? I don't think it really has, actually. No, and, and then fascinating to see what happens in that seat come the general election. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. The rest of the day's news? Yeah, let's turn our attention to Germany first and foremost, because the trial of Christian B, who is the main suspect in the disappearance of Madeleine McCann, resumes in Germany today. In what is a separate case, the 47-year-old faces three counts of rape and two for the sexual abuse of children. Our crime correspondent Martin Brunt is outside the court in Brunswick for us. And Martin, like we say, this case is featuring the same person, but is separate to the Madeleine McCann situation. Yes, Christian B is the suspect for the disappearance of Madeleine McCann, but he's on trial here for completely unrelated sex crimes. Um, three alleged rapes and two alleged sex attacks on young children, all committed over a period of 17 years in Portugal. But he's in jail here already for uh, a rape crime, another rape crime, um, and he's being tried here. And today, as uh, the hearing gets underway in the next few minutes. We're going to hear from one of the key witnesses in this trial, a German man called Manfred Seyferth. And he is a friend, I should say, former friend of Christian B. He's going to be a key prosecution witness because among his evidence will be that he claims uh, some years ago to have discovered a video at the home of Christian B in Portugal on which he says Christian B had filmed himself raping an elderly woman and raping a teenage girl. And those are two of the charges, two of the rape charges that Christian B faces during this trial. Now, the intriguing thing about this man's evidence is that he says he found this tape, he saw this videotape, 
but nobody's ever seen it. Uh, the authorities, the police investigators in Portugal and in Germany have never discovered uh, whether this tape exists. According to Manfred Seyforth, uh, it did exist and he's seen Christian B raping two victims. Now, Christian B's lawyer is, uh, is going to have a field day with this witness because he will question his motives for giving evidence against his former friend, but he will also question the very existence of this tape that the authorities have never been able to find. Martin, for the moment, thank you. Naturally, we'll follow the course of the developments. The National Audit Office has warned that the cost just of the government's Rwanda scheme could reach almost half a billion pounds. The UK will have sent £370 million to Kigali by 2026, and a further £120 million will be paid once the first 300 people have been deported. The Shadow Home Secretary says the findings are shocking. This scheme will cost the taxpayer over half a billion pounds just to send 300 people to Rwanda. That is less than 1% of those arriving in the country. It's a cost of about £2 million per person. This is a shocking revelation in this report that they've tried to hide. We should be investing that money in boosting our border security, in going after the criminal smuggler gangs instead. Ireland's President Michael D. Higgins has spent the night in hospital after reporting he felt unwell. The 82-year-old was taken for tests in Dublin after being assessed by a doctor at his official residence in, in the capital. The President said to be in excellent spirits and thanked medical staff for the care that he's received. Now, the funeral of Alexei Navalny, Russian President Vladimir Putin's fiercest political opponent will take place later on today in Moscow. Well, let's cross live now to our Moscow correspondent, Diana Magne, who's there for us. Um, Diana, how much do we know about the form that this funeral service will take? Well, we know from Navalny's team that it will be at 2 p.m., which is about two and a half hours from now, in Marina, which is in the southeast of Moscow, Navalny's home district, um, at a church there, and then at a nearby cemetery for the burial at 4 p.m. And, um, and we'll, we'll be going there soon. But the police have been preparing for a few days now, and there are a lot of metal barriers that we've seen being transported there um, to funnel the crowd. So they clearly are expecting a large number of people. We also understand that a lot of surveillance cameras have been put up all around the church and the cemetery, um, that there may be police checks where you have to show your documents and what is in your bag. So the police are certainly preparing for a major um, uh, event. Uh, and I think we can safely assume that there will be thousands, if not tens of thousands of people, because really this is the only way to show your discontent, your rage in this police state now. Um, for a man who was one of the few who would still and was still prepared to fight the regime on behalf of the people. And despite the fact that, as we heard from Yulia Navalny in the European Parliament, we don't know whether there will be detentions today. And I think perhaps if people stay long, uh, long into the evening, there very well may be. Um, people will still come out, just as we saw people coming out to lay flowers over the course of the last two weeks. People will still come out to pay their respects to Alexei Navalny one last time. OK, Diana, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Now, there's been condemnation of Israel after more than 100 people were killed in Gaza while trying to receive humanitarian aid. Our Middle East correspondent, Alastair Bunkel, has the latest now from Jerusalem. The Palestinians say that they were fired upon by the Israeli Defence Forces. Uh, the Israeli Defence Forces say that what actually happened was that there was a stampede around the aid convoy. Uh, and during that, people were, were trampled. Um, the drivers of the trucks accidentally ran some people over. But the IDF has admitted that some of its soldiers did open fire because they say that the soldiers felt that they were under threat, that their security was at risk. And the other 
complicating factor in all this is that it was dark. It was before dawn. And so um, trying to find any documentary evidence to um, you know, come to a, a firm conclusion to what happened one way or the other is, is very tricky indeed. And, and you do have these two versions of events. And I think that is why the Americans last night didn't back a statement in the UN Security Council uh, condemning Israel, because they say they, they simply don't know yet what, what the truth is. And I think you know, there is an element um, of, of sense in that. But at the same time, the Americans are becoming clearly increasingly frustrated. Now, with over a million people still trapped in southern Gaza, ahead of the threatened Israeli invasion, one Egyptian company is making millions from Palestinians desperate to escape. After taking complete control of the process known as coordination, essentially an institutionalised system of bribes, the company has increased payments from $350 to over $5,000. Sky's Tom Cheshire has more. Even from this remote aerial view, almost like an X-ray, you can feel the desperation of Palestinians. Trying to get food, crowding the trucks bringing it, finding death instead. Dozens of people were killed here near Gaza City, a shocking loss of life, its cause disputed by both sides. It is yet another reason why, here on the ground, people are so desperate to leave. A tent city that grows with each family that arrives here. Rafa on the border with Egypt. No one wants to be here. But there is a way out. It is one that Amani, not her real name, and her children are trying to seek. But a Sky News investigation can reveal how one Egyptian company controls that crossing and that they've increased their prices 14-fold since the start of the war, earning more than $1 million each day from the refugees of Rafa. One former industry insider said he quit his job because of the price hikes, telling us, quote, I refuse to partake in the crime of these prices and the extortion. That leaves Armani and hundreds of thousands of people like her trapped in Gaza. Life is hard and it's a big responsibility without a father to raise five kids. Maybe if the price goes down, he can take us out, but it's not possible. God willing, the price will go down. Officially, Egypt and Israel only allow the exit of foreign nationals and injured evacuees. In reality, though, there's a third option. And this is what it looks like before the war. It's a Halla advert for travel across the border, a list known as coordination. More than half the people who leave Gaza now get out this way. Based on social media posts and the testimony of dozens of people who've arranged travel with Halla since October the 7th, Sky News was able to piece together a clear picture of how the company operates. Tickets used to cost in the region of $350, around £280 before the war. But Halla price lists show people are now looking at $5,000 per person to guarantee a way out, and $2,500 for children. Passenger lists are released daily, sometimes pictures taken of paper sheets posted on social media. On average, 235 people travel a day. Some passengers with Egyptian nationality pay a lower fare. But Sky News analysis of Halla crossing lists and prices shows that on a day with few Egyptian passengers, the company can earn in excess of $1 million. Sky News asked Egypt's foreign minister about the money being made by Halla transferring Palestinians across his border. We do not condone it and we will uh, take whatever measures uh, that we need to so as to restrict it and eliminate it totally. There, there should be no... Uh, advantage taken out of this situation uh, for monetary gain. Human Rights Watch told us that statement rang false, that there's no way Halle could operate without the say-so of the Egyptian military. We put that allegation back to the Egyptian government, but we didn't receive a reply. And Halle itself did not respond to any of our requests for comment. For all the talk of ceasefire, Israel is still committed to one final ground assault in Rafah and Amani and her children are stuck. We're always flirting with wars, always bombing. There's no safety. Our ambitions are for the war to end, for our lives to return. But there is no immediate prospect of that return, nor of fleeing this place. The cost is just too much. Everyone's fear is that the cost of not being able to pay may finally prove higher. Tom Cheshire, Sky News. 
Now, MPs have called for a fresh review into evidence for those who suffered avoidable harm from the use of controversial pregnancy test drug Primados. Uh, our Home Editor, Jason Farrell, is here with me. And this is something that I know that you've been investigating for years now. So what is this latest development, Jason? Well, first of all, Primados, drug taken by women, given to them by their GPs in the 60s and 70s, a pregnancy test. And many believe that it led to malformations and stillbirths. Uh, and in some cases, uh, uh, babies being miscarried. And so they've been campaigning for decades. Uh, there was a government review back in uh, 2017 which found that there was insufficient evidence to show a causation between the drug and birth defects. But these MPs are saying that that review was flawed. Uh, they give a list of reasons, uh, which I don't have time to go into, but uh, a lot of reasons why they believe that that was flawed. One, for example, is that a group of academics in Oxford actually got the raw data that was used in that report and came to a completely different conclusion. They found that there was a link between the drug and malformations. Uh, and they believe that the government is hiding, they say, hiding behind this report. In fact, the government used that report uh, to strike out a claim by the, uh, by the claimants last year uh, alongside the manufacturers. So they want the evidence reviewed. And what's interesting as well is this is a group of cross-party MPs. You remember the post office scandal uh, represented by Lord Abuthnot uh, as the, the MP there. These are MPs who are dealing with their constituency issues and they come from all different uh, colours and they've come together and they said the government needs to shift on this. More people need to get on what they believe is the right moral side of this story uh, and make sure that this is properly reviewed and that people receive justice. Yeah, all the more powerful than you think, given the fact that it's MPs from across the board. Exactly. You think that it might um, have more weight. Um, Jason, really interesting. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, let's take a look now at what the weather's doing. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, today marks the start of the meteorological spring, but heavy rain will keep the flood risk while snow will affect some hills, which doesn't sound very spring-like, does it? Uh, it's cold out there now, with rain, sleet and hill snow moving across England, Wales and Ireland. Britain will turn more showery in the south through the morning as the rain, sleet and hill snow clears into central parts, perhaps affecting Northern Ireland as well. Meanwhile, Ireland will see the wintry weather becoming confined to the south and east. Elsewhere, Scotland will be largely fine, but the far northwest will be wet and it'll be colder than yesterday and windier across central and southern parts. The afternoon will see Ireland drying up while showers take over more of England and Wales with hail, thunder and hill snow possible. Scotland will have a spell of rain, sleet and hill snow tonight while many other parts see showers, some of them wintry. It'll turn chilly with an uh, ice risk as well. And Saturday will bring further showers with hail and thunder possible. <sighs> oh, dear. And Scotland and Eastern England can expect general rain and hill snow. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. We're going to get the thoughts now of Conservative MP Tobias Elwood uh, to some of our main stories this morning. Tobias Elwood, thanks so much for joining us today. We do appreciate it. And, and I want to get your reaction to the incident in Gaza in a moment. But first, I just wondered if you could react to the story overnight and George Galloway winning the Rochdale by-election. What do you make of that? I mean, this was a chaotic by-election. Um, it's taking place when temperatures are already very, very high, as we've been seeing in the uh, the headlines and you've been broadcasting. This should have been an easy win for Labour, uh, following the loss of, of Tony Lloyd. But, you know, many Britons will be waking up today asking themselves if George Galloway is the answer. We really don't know what the question is. I read some of his literature. They are so full of hate. They're designed to rally fear. They're designed to cause division, an entire campaign based on Gaza. That's not to say that's not important. I've been involved in that discussion. But ultimately, well, well, yes, he, he would say, just to cut in, populism. sorry, Tobias Elwood, just to cut in, he would say it's not about hate, it's about supporting people who are in great difficulty. I haven't got a, a problem with that at all, and I would I would uh, be one of the first to, to be there too. Ultimately, you look at the language that he's using, and it is inflammatory. It doesn't offer answers. It simply articulates problems. And uh, he plays politics very, very well indeed, but he offers no political leadership. 
And we'll no doubt see this demonstrated in the House of Commons very, very soon when he takes uh, his seat. And that is a concern I have, not just for this by-election, but for where our elections are going, with the general election coming up as well. Such inflammatory language that is used uh, on leaflets and so forth to really, as I say, uh, encourage people to dive into their hatred rather than look to the positive side, the constructive places to where Britain should actually go. But the only positive takeaway that I see is, you know, the Conservatives came third. By-elections are usually un unhelpful um, snapshots of where the, the country sits at the moment. Uh, but the fact that the Conservatives, I think, uh, uh, pulled very, very well uh, indeed in this chaotic situation shows literally that uh, the next general election, when it'll be more about who runs the country, who runs the economy, where is our nation going, um, that is going to be a very, very different uh, perspective. I certainly hope that the bar will be raised because this was a very, very horrible by-election to watch. And, of course, George Galloway isn't here, but I'm sure that he would dispute that description of his language being inflammatory. Um, he said that his victory was for Gaza, and I do want to ask you about Gaza, because more than 100 people have been reportedly killed there yesterday uh, while trying to get aid. Different accounts from each side about what happened, but how concerned are you about that incident? Uh, very much indeed. I and mean, we're seeing these further headlines, but this was a, a terrible, uh, terrible uh, attack, uh, image, the images that are emerging. It's probably set back, if we're honest, any chance of securing uh, a form of uh, uh, you know, pause in the fighting to get a hostage exchange prior to the start of Ramadan. You know, I've been very supportive of Israel. It's right to defend itself, but there's not been a clear strategy that sits behind what Prime Minister Netanyahu is doing with his superior military force in Gaza. What is his objective? What's the governance and security structure that he's aiming towards? And now we see events like this. They're caused by the chaos of war. There's no third party there to even monitor what's going on. And certainly what we're seeing is because of uh, the approach by Israel that the aid isn't getting in in the scale that's required. This, I understand, was caused by aid trucks getting into the north um, of the Strip. The first time they've been there for some time. Absolute panic to get there. And then in that pandemonium, shots were fired. The idea that now uh, Netanyahu wants to then plough into Rafa is simply wrong. And he's hemorrhaging international support that was there from the very start when those barbaric attacks took place on the 7th of October. I would actually like to see what we used in the British Army when I served uh, the yellow card, the, 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 the rules of engagement, the, the individual requirements of any soldier to uphold uh, international law. I'd like to see that um, from the Israeli perspective. It is something so, so important that in the heat of the moment, any individual soldier knows what standards they need to be upholding uh, because their immediate boss, their uh, uh, commander, or indeed the political leaders can't be there all the time to underline that. We need to ensure that this simply doesn't continue to spiral out of control because that's exactly what's happening right now. And the US President Joe Biden has said uh, that this incident will complicate the ceasefire talks, as, as you indeed have said yourself. Also from the US yesterday, the Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin was asked how many Palestinian women and children have been killed since the October the 7th attacks. He said over 25,000, which is, of course, a, a staggering number. What do you make of him saying that? What do you make of the figure? And do you sense a change of tone from the US? These are unacceptable numbers, however you put this. And uh, uh, that's why I'm saying I've been, I think it's wrong. Just the tactics that the Israeli military are using in order to secure their objective, which I, and I underline, I still don't understand. So the scale of killing and the fact that you get the Americans the Israel's most closest security ally, now publicly saying these things. Imagine what they're saying behind the scenes. This simply cannot go on. There will become a tipping point um, where Israel will be told uh, that uh, your approach in, uh, in taking on Hamas uh, is simply not working. And we're going to have to look at other ways of getting aid in, whether that's to create uh, our own humanitarian corridor in potentially from uh, the sea or via uh, Egypt as well, that we control, that is separate to Israel. That's where this goes uh, if we don't see an improvement on this. But ultimately, 
the bigger picture now is the famine is that we're potentially going to outbreak in Gaza as well. The scale of death there is going to be absolutely abhorrent. And I make it really clear, the international community cannot sit by uh, and, and watch this happen. Calls for a ceasefire, I appreciate this is a, uh, you know, a, a clarion call coming from everywhere. Ceasefire is something that we all want to get there, but there are steps to get there. The steps are, starts with a cessation of hostilities, which is what the British government has absolutely called for. That allows that aid in. That's got to be the, the priority right now. OK, well, Tobias Elwood, we, we appreciate your time this morning. Thanks very much indeed for sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Do so with us. We've got lots coming up for you here on The Breakfast Show, including I'm going to be speaking to a nutritionist about why obesity has become a greater threat to global health than hunger. And we've got the sport for you as well. Lewis Hamilton and Mercedes provide the shocks on the track in practice for the season opening Bahrain Grand Prix. Hello, welcome back. In a moment, we're going to be talking about the global problem of obesity. Uh, that's coming up in a moment, but you've got the top stories for us first. Certainly, you? let's start, shall we, with George Galloway, who's won the Rochdale by-election, securing 40% of the vote. The veteran pro-Palestinian campaigner began his speech with a message to the Labour leader, saying, Kiss Starmer, this is for Gaza. Secretary-General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, has led calls for an investigation into an incident which saw more than 100 Palestinians lose their lives. 112 people were killed by Israeli fire while waiting for aid at a roundabout in northern Gaza. Israel has denied it deliberately targeted the convoy. 
The National Audit Office has warned that the cost of the government's Rwanda asylum scheme could soar to £500 million. The Home Office has refused to say how much more money, on top of the £290 million already confirmed, that the UK has agreed to pay to Kigali. And obesity is now a greater threat to global health than hunger. That's a warning from scientists who say more than a billion people worldwide are now obese, including nearly 160 million children. So let's talk more about just that subject. Um, I'm joined now by a nutritionist, Monica Price, who's here with me, but also Molly Malone is here, who can talk us through, Molly. Um, what has come out today? There's a report, isn't there, that suggests there's a huge number of people across the world now with this problem of obesity. Yeah, that's right. Data published in the Lancet Journal, the scientific journal, uh, looking at data from 190 different countries, data between 1990 and 2022. In that time, they found a quadrupling of obesity levels in children and more than doubling in adults. 159 million children and 879 million adults are considered obese. Now, in the Pacific Island nations, we're seeing a particular problem. So you're looking at 70 to 80% in places like uh, Tonga uh, and American Samoa. But the UK clearly has an issue too. 16.8 million people are considered obese. And for adults, that's a BMI of above uh, 30. And that includes 760,000 boys, children and 590 and girls. Now, in terms of why this is happening, the report uh, points to access and the cost of food in certain island nations. Um, but in the UK, it's the promotion of unhealthy habits, it's the promotion of unhealthy uh, foods. So, so yeah, but vari variation uh, in the data there. But NHS England, in, in terms of the problems in the UK, is calling the figures uh, alarming, but actually, importantly, stressing that this isn't a problem that the health service can fix. And actually, it's very much a societal in issue that if it's going to change, is on us, essentially. Yeah, that's so interesting, isn't it? Mm. And, and welcome properly Thank to you, you Monica. Thank nice you. to, see you. Um, to um, see you. Are you surprised by these figures, that, that it's getting worse, this issue, even though there's a lot of talk about the dangers of obesity yes. to our health? I would like to say that I would be surprised, but unfortunately I'm not. I think any health practitioner, anybody that works in health, have, have, we've, we've come to realise now that this has just been a growing um, epidemic, really, of obesity. What you know, If you think about it, we've got 67 million people in the UK, and you know, 16.8 million of those are now obese. So that's it's a quarter of our nation now, in, just in the UK, that are now obese, with a BMI of over 30, as, as Molly's just said. And it, I think it's because we've we've just not we're, we're just not educating ourselves about what food we, we need to eat. Do you think that's what it is? It's I a, do. a lack of awareness of what's I do. healthy yes. and what's going to. I do. Eating. I think we're 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 kind of awashed with with adverts. You know, eat this. This is really healthy for you. You know, have this protein shake. This is going to be really good for you. But we just need to get. I think we're fighting fire with fire. Um, as a nutritionist, I'm seeing more and more people come to me with you know overweight problems. You know, so that causes diabetes. That can cause heart disease, high blood pressure. So these are things that they're going to put emphasis on our NHS that is already struggling. So we need to, I think we need to go back to the core of the problem and educate. Well, yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? Because there have been various uh, programmes to yes. try to tell people about the, the dangers. So what is going to make the message land? How, how do you um, advise people when some people don't want to be advised, it's no. a bit like it's my choice, it's my body, yes. I'll eat what I like. Exactly. I think what it is, if you empower someone, I always think education is, is mm. empowerment. If you empower that person with the educating, if you eat that slice of cake and you eat that cake all the way through the day and don't have anything else, that's just generalising, that is not going to lead to a healthy diet. That's going to make your heart, your heart beat faster, it's going to raise your blood pressure, it's going to put you more susceptible and at risk to diabetes. Whereas if you educate somebody and tell them that if you have have a broad, healthy, varied diet, um, you know, throughout the, all of your life, then you're on the best, best path you can possibly do, be to make sure that you don't have any of these diseases that are increasing, of course. But there are other factors as well, aren't there? There's cost. Oh, yes, the yeah, well. yeah, so that's one of the big part of this. Yes. More people are more likely to. to rely on issues the because they, they do can't yeah and, and they they tend to you know go for the ready meals which are a pound you can buy a ready meal for pound in some stores and it's again it's about educating the the younger generation for me it's the early years we've got to we've got to educate bring back you know cooking back in schools things that i used to have in schools then it makes you appreciate where the food comes from you know how it grows and it was interesting what you were saying about you know polynesia and the, the mm. tonga islands you know they used to have a really healthy diet there and now they have the highest rate of obesity in the world because they've introduced our Western diet.
Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a huge challenge, isn't mm -hmm. it? Because governments also don't necessarily want to be seen as being the nanny state. Yes, right. uh, And yet, at the same time, you know, this is a huge strain on the health service. It's a cost. Yeah, they are also in the report pointing out to external factors like climate change, like the Ukraine war, in terms of those island nations and their access to certain foods, um, but clearly relying, as you say, on yes. different diets. Okay, well, Molly and Monica, thank you, thank both, you so very much, much indeed. Thank you. Uh, let's just show you the live uh, pictures that we're getting in from Moscow right now. This is the scene ahead of Alexei Navalny, the Russian opposition leader who died just uh, days ago now. Uh, with people gathering, you can probably just about make that out, uh, for the funeral service of Alexei Navalny, which takes place later today. Um, his family and supporters had accused the Kremlin of delaying the handover of his body and blackmailing them into agreeing a private funeral. Um, so all eyes on that funeral, which takes place, we're told, at 2 o'clock Moscow time uh, this afternoon. Now, in the meantime... Ellie's here. The sports and uh, Formula One taking up a lot of attention today. Yeah, exactly. The season starting again, but lots happening off the track as well. So we'll bring you up to date with that next. Here's the sport. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. Now, this signifies a corner, OK? I don't want this and I don't want that. I need the hand up here, OK? That is contested. It's school on a Sunday, but nobody's complaining because the lesson is the laws of the game and the classroom is Villa Park. The FA wants to find 1,000 new black, Asian and mixed heritage referees from different communities around the country. It's part of the reflective and representative campaign. We want to increase the pool of referees from these communities at a grassroots level with the hope that in the future that these individuals can then go through the referee and progression pathway and then eventually a referee within the Women's Super League and in the Premier League. Historically, maybe the interest wasn't there, but actually we haven't probably done enough to actually showcase what refereeing is about. You're going to go there and blow, blow the whistle and give a direct free kick. A lot of challenges that people talked about, the themes were, you know, referee courses were too expensive. Um, and that's why we've employed a bursary scheme as part of this campaign. You two go. Going into grassroots football and going into it as a referee, um, with all the other challenges that I have, uh, the other added challenge will be um, the, the, the discrimination angle. You need to blow the whistle and put your hand like this. It's got to be like this on every single cone. The achievements of Sam Allison, Rebecca Welsh and Sonny Singil have highlighted the importance of role models and mentors within refereeing, with new refs coming through having people to aspire to. The organisation BAM Ref was set up to increase levels of representation in refereeing and we're in attendance on the day. Straight arm out. Well, I've never seen this before. It's absolutely amazing to be part of a room full of young, black, Asian, mixed heritage uh, young people ready to start their refereeing journey. Do you remember when you first stepped into a room ready to do a referee call? I was the only female and I was the only black and Asian uh, mixed heritage of that community. To see this happening right now, this is what we need. We need people to feel that they belong in refereeing. And we're going to stop, blow and give a penalty. Yeah, still got it there. What I'm really, really um, so pleased to, about today is the fact that we've got a huge, wide, wide range, young 16-year-olds all the way up to adults really 12 years ago it was literally I walked into the room and it was a room full of about 45 people and I was the only person of color when you look at the makeup of the football clubs the players themselves they, there's a very wide diverse background but actually onto the field of play as the officials no there isn't over 200 people access the bursary scheme between this sky news sports bulletin is brought to you by vitality Still to come here on The Breakfast Show. We've got lots for you. We're going to be finding out why a charity for Ukrainian children is attempting to break the record for the largest school assembly.
Spencer and I'm Sky News' arts and entertainment correspondent. As a team, we've interviewed some of the biggest stars in the world, the likes of Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, Sir Elton John. We try to give you an honest sense of how these people really are. I'm Martin Brunt and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. My most memorable story was, and still is, the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Please, please do not hurt her. Please give our little girl back. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. For detectives, the first 48 hours after a murder are crucial in the search for clues. The public expects them to find Jill Dando's killer soon. I remember the grimmest case, the Sower murders of schoolgirls Holly and Jessica. I felt I can't undo what's happened, but I can help explain it. Ian Huntley was arrested and charged within a fortnight of the murders. My biggest challenge was to persuade a jail diamond thief to answer my letters. Martin Brunt, Sky News at the Old Bailey. I'm very happy to say that Trevor Phillips is here and has joined us. Hello to you. Hello to you. What's more important is that you're here as Comeback Friday. That is Fr important. This is, this is Comeback <laughs> Friday, important. Anna. Comeback Friday. I've had a holiday. It was very nice. <laughs> but, uh, yes, I have returned and very happy to see you and hear about your show on Sunday. Um, I imagine that the Rochdale by-election might crop up. Well, it, may, it may, may pass across our lips. I mean... Um, of course, today's big news is your comeback, but people are also talking about the comeback of George Galloway, who, um, you have to say, uh, for somebody who generates such a lot of controversy, uh, w whether you like him or not, the guy has done an extraordinary thing in winning this, uh, this by-election. I think it's the, the third time he's essentially beaten his own old party, Labour, um, in this situation. Uh, and it's been, it's a remarkable victory. I think what is most interesting about this, what's happened last night, is that it's going to make us think harder about politics. I, I don't, frankly, buy the whole idea, that, you know, there's going to be workers' party MPs all over the place. But I think George Galloway is really smart. He spotted a couple of things. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, how is it that a by-election in a northern town essentially gets decided by what's happening in Gaza. How is it that the top two candidates here, Ga um, Galloway and Paul Talley, the, the uh, businessman, together got twice as many votes as all the other candidates put together? That is big, a massive slap in the face for the conventional parties. And by the way, for us, because we interview those people and we are missing the people that the voters actually vote for. And I think the, the other thing that I would say uh, about this is the, the, the one that I expected to see uh, was reform. And it's really interesting. Nowhere in this. So there's some mysteries here which we're going to be trying to unpack on Sunday. Yeah, it'll be fascinating. And also to see, you know, what the wider implications are, whether mm. it's a, a sort of a, a one-off case or not. The other big issue coming up is the budget next yeah. week. It's, and you're going to be looking ahead to that, obviously. Yes, we happily have the Chancellor with us and we're going to have 
no doubt, an extraordinary interview in which he, ex <laughs> he tells me... Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Sunday morning rounds that the Chancellor does. Yeah. I always find it a bit weird, because he comes I... on, you ask him what's going to be in the budget, he goes, well, I can't tell I can't you, tell it's happening that. on yeah. Wednesday. No, look, I am a glass-half-full guy. <laughs> this is going to the mo be the morning in which uh, Jeremy Hunt comes on and he says, well, Trevor... I know that I should leave this for the House of Commons, but I'm going to tell you. Seen as it is. He's going to bring his box I'm, with I'm going to share it because it's just me and you. Um, no, I expect there's going to be quite a lot of that. We'll see whether, essentially, how much money has he got? And the money he's got, will he spend it on tax cuts? Will he spend it on defence? Will he spend it on hospitals or education? At least we'll get some signal, I think. Um, we won't get the rabbit out of the hat, but I think... It's, it's going to be interesting to see how he deals with the speculation. But I, coming back to what we were talking about earlier in Rochdale, isn't it interesting that this morning the big news is not the budget? Uh, in all my time in politics, we would have been talking about the budget for weeks before, but actually something's happened in politics. Galloway is right. The tectonic plate, as he called them, quoting John Prescott, have shifted... The, thing, the agenda of politics is different to what it used to be. Really interesting times. We'll look forward to your show. Uh, Trevor, thanks very much indeed. And just to remind everybody, uh, it will be a packed show. And uh, let me tell you when it's on. Uh, he's going to be speaking to the Chancellor, as he says, Jeremy Hunt, ahead of next week's budget. And he'll get more reaction to uh, that Galloway win in Rochdale uh, with the Shadow Education Secretary, Bridget Phillipson. That Sunday morning with Trevor Phillips, live from 8.30 here on Sky News. Now, hundreds of schools are joining together this morning to try and set a new world record for the largest ever online school assembly. Well, the education charity Svitlow School has organised the pupil-led assembly, which will hear from three Ukrainian students to mark the two-year anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine. And joining me now is Yulia Kosko, who founded the Svitlow School. Uh, so, a very good morning to you. Good morning. Welcome. Very nice to see you. you. I hope we're not holding you up. Is the no, assembly about sorry. to get underway? They prepared the room for me where I could Oh, you are going to do it in a minute. <laughs> so, tell us about it. What's the plan? Uh, well, yes, Svitlow Education was um, founded in March 2022. Um, unfortunately, with the you know, sad situation in, in Ukraine, where the, when the war escalated to a full invasion, and... There was uh, this group of children, a large group, right? Millions of children in Ukraine who did not have any schooling. So uh, my former school in Ukraine, I come from Ukraine originally, helped me to arrange the um, lessons. And we grew into an online school catering for over 2,500 children with a very important mission to empower the next generation of Ukrainian children to become the future political and social leaders, but also global citizens with amazing English. Uh, skills because all of our lessons are in English, run by volunteers from the UK, whom we train. So we thought it would be great to celebrate the education. As um, I'm sure everybody is aware, the Nelson Mandela uh, famous quote that educa uh, education is the greatest weapon to change the world. So we want to divert children's um, uh, sorrow into uh, uh, something positive and channel that energy into building and fighting for their future. What now, when they're young and prepare themselves for when their occupation is over? Which which sounds brilliant. <laughs> and the, the assembly itself, the what assembly form itself will is... that take? So who have you got involved and how many people are you trying to get online for? Uh, so we have a lot of school uh, who connected from National Association of Head Teachers in the UK. We uh, have, we are going to be streaming it online on YouTube. So if you go on our website, svitloschool.com, there is a clear button which says you can connect to it. It starts at 9.15 today and it will last 15 minutes and you will hear from three wonderful children. One is uh, a refugee in Europe, one is a refugee in the UK and one child stayed in Ukraine about their educational journey in the last two years. And you're hoping for a record, aren't you? We are hoping for a record, yes. <laughs> oh, well, good luck with that. I know you have got to go and uh, make sure it's all set up properly, but thanks so much for finding the time to, Thank you so much. to chat to us uh, before it gets underway. I hope it goes really well. I hope so, too. And we'll Thank fingers so crossed much. for that record. <laughs> Thank you. Let's take a look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. 
Well, today marks the start of the meteorological spring, but heavy rain will keep the flood risk, while snow will affect some hills. It's cold out there now, with rain, sleet and hill snow moving across England, Wales and Ireland. Britain will turn more showery in the south through the morning as the rain, sleet and hill snow clears into central parts, perhaps affecting Northern Ireland too. Meanwhile, Ireland will see some wintry weather coming confined to the south and the east. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Now, seeing as we've mentioned my holiday, I thought I'd mention it again. <laughs> uh, before <laughs> I <holiday>. went, <laughs> yes, um, before I went, we we got into a habit of getting you to eat and drink various things, yeah, and I, I think we're reviving that. that. Had it gone away while I was Rob's away? food yeah. corner. Yeah. It right, is. OK, so there's a story in The Telegraph today about Marks and Spencer's apparently bringing back whole milk coffee, so using whole milk instead of uh, semi-skimmed milk, because apparently younger people are switching on to whole, whole fat milk, because apparently there's some doubt over whether actually big fat milk like that actually was as bad for you as possible. So I think what um, our editor has done to stitch me up yet again on The Breakfast <laughs> Programme is get, I think, a skimmed and a full fat to try and see if we can um, taste the difference between it. So, hang on. When you say we, we mean you. You, yeah. yeah. You're welcome to it. Right. Uh, mm. <laughs> what do you normally have? No, you can see it. Is yeah. It very obvious? It's just more creamy and it's just a bit more... I can see it, but I always thought, like, whole milk like that was genuinely not as good for you. Yeah, cos it was more fatty and they thought that that was, wasn't going to be good no, for no, you. What do you guys have? Uh, I generally have black coffee. Which doesn't which go down well with my dairy farmer <laughs> friends, who kind of look at me with disdain. Um, That's a man whose alarm goes off at three in the morning. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, I used to have that and then was switched on to all of these sort of unicorn milk matches and stuff like that by certain people in the office. So now I've got, like, oats and coconut and all sorts that I drink now. But... So, so what are you going with? I get it. I think it would be... I think if you're trying to sell your coffee, it definitely is tastes better, but... That's the breaking news. Rob goes full Good fat. News. There you go. Bring <laughs> Top stories, stories up next.
Hello, very good morning. It's nine o'clock. Coming up on today's show, an astonishing political comeback for George Galloway, who wins the Rochdale by-election. He said Sir Keir Starmer was on notice and it was a vote for Gaza. Labour told this programme it hadn't turned out the way they wanted. Plus, we'll hear about what MPs are calling one of the biggest medical frauds of the 20th century. It's Friday the 1st of March. I do hereby declare that George Galloway is duly... <laughs> George Galloway is back, winning in Rochdale with more than 12,000 votes. Keir Starmer, this is for Gaza. Condemnation of Israel after more than 100 people are killed in Gaza while trying to receive humanitarian aid. A Sky News investigation reveals the company making millions from Gaza's misery and people desperate to get out. The National Audit Office warns that the cost of the government's Rwanda asylum scheme could soar to £500 million. And in sport, Red Bull boss Christian Horner has dismissed what he calls anonymous speculation after alleged evidence in his misconduct investigation is leaked on the first day of the new Formula One season. Hello, very good morning, and thanks for joining us here on The Breakfast Show. Our top story here this morning, the return of George Galloway. The veteran left-winger and pro-Palestinian campaigner has won the Rochdale by-election. He said in his victory speech, Keir Starmer, this is for Gaza, and announced that he wants to stand 50 candidates in the general election. There was no official Labour candidate in what was a chaotic campaign after the party withdrew its support for Azhar Ali in a row over anti-Semitism. Well, Mr Galloway received 12,335 votes, giving him a majority of nearly 6,000. An independent candidate came second, beating the Tories, who came in third. And Labour's disavowed candidate was fourth. That means the vote share looks like this. George Galloway's Workers' Party of Britain got 39.7% and nobody else came close. Our chief political correspondent, John Craig, reports from Rochdale. George Galloway is A stunning Commons comeback by George Galloway and Keir Starmer's worst nightmare. Keir Starmer, this is for Gaza. You have paid and you will pay a high price for the role that you have played in enabling, encouraging and covering for the catastrophe presently going on in occupied Palestine in the Gaza Strip. Then from the count, Mr Galloway headed back to his campaign HQ to address his jubilant supporters. There are thousands of people here whose hearts are breaking over what's happening in Gaza. The candidate Labour disowned over his comments on Israel, Azhar Ali, came fourth behind an independent and the Conservatives. And another former Labour MP, Reform UK candidate Simon Danchuk, came a humiliating sixth, prompting his party leader to accuse opponents of dirty tricks. Our candidate has suffered vile, racist abuse and death threats. Our staff have been intimidated. We've had to move them from accommodation. We've had to engage security guards. Our business supporters have been threatened with being firebombed. While Mr Galloway's win was widely predicted, a surprise was independent David Tully coming second, well ahead of the established political parties. I wanted to really try and break the mould of um, Labour, Tories, and, and that's what I feel we've achieved in the last four weeks. With Sir Keir already under fire from the left of his party and the SNP on Gaza ceasefire calls, Mr Galloway's election in what was a safe Labour seat is a disaster. The work starts on Monday. And Mr Galloway now hopes to field up to 50 pro-Palestine candidates in the general election with the aim of inflicting more damage on Labour. John Craig, Sky News, Rochdale. Well, let's cross live now to our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, who's in Rochdale for us this morning. Hello to you, Sam. So, a big victory for George Galloway. 
how much of a big headache is this for, for Keir Starmer? It's potentially really quite a huge problem for the Labour leader. At 5.30 this morning, the Labour Party issued a statement apologising for the election of a candidate to Parliament and blaming themselves for not putting up someone to represent the people of Rochdale, an area that they, the Labour Party, have represented and held for years and years. One of the most well-known faces of left-wing politics, George Galloway, who was first elected to Parliament in 1987 as a Labour MP, is now back and he has Keir Starmer uh, who's the leader of the party that George Galloway once represented firmly in his sights. This morning, George Galloway told me that he wanted to crush the Labour Party. He is more angry with the Labour Party uh, for what he sees as a betrayal of the working class and what he claims as a betrayal of the people uh, of, of Palestinians and the people of Gaza than he is uh, with the Conservative Party. This feels like a big moment. He is determined to use his platform from Monday in the House of Commons to go for Keir Starmer and to raise the issue of Gaza and what's happening in the Middle East in a way that will be deliberately designed to make life uncomfortable for the Labour leader. He'll be teaming up with Jeremy Corbyn, the former Labour leader, uh, and in certain ways with the SNP uh, in order to put his case forward uh, and try and advance uh, his argument. He actually wants to stand somewhere in the region of 50 candidates in the next general election. Uh, he wants to change politics uh, again. Uh, as a 69-year-old, he's been around for many decades. Uh, can he use his skills of oratory uh, and his political talents in order to uh, really change the weather in Parliament? That's what we're going to be finding out in the coming weeks. Yeah, it's going to be absolutely fascinating. OK, Sam, thanks very much indeed. The trial of Christian B, who is the main suspect in the disappearance of Madeleine McCann, resumes in Germany today. This is a separate case in which the 47-year-old faces three counts of rape and two for the sexual abuse of children. Our crime correspondent, Martin Brunt, is outside the court for us. And Martin, tell us more about the, the key witness we're expecting to hear from today. This is a man called uh, Manfred Seyferth, who is, or probably more accurately, was a friend of Christian B. And a self-confessed petty criminal said that he used to take part in a uh, life of crime with Christian B um, some years ago along the Algarve coast. Um, Christian B is on trial for offences unrelated to the Madeleine McCann case, in which he is... Uh, the main suspect. Um, he's facing three rape charges and two charges of sexual attacks on children. And uh, Mr Seyferth um, has recounted in the last few minutes a story that he's told in interviews um, before this trial. Uh, he says that some years ago he and uh, another friend of Christian B's uh, broke into his house while Christian B was in jail on some other matter and they discovered a video uh, amongst other things inside his house and according to Manfred Seyferth on that video uh, was footage of Christian B raping an old woman, uh, an elderly woman uh, in her 80s and a young teenage girl, a girl that the prosecution say w was probably about 14 or 15. Neither of those two alleged victims have been identified. And the, the, the interesting thing about Seyfert's evidence about this video is that he and one other man say they found this video, but the authorities have never seen it. Uh, it's never been uncovered by the police investigators in Germany or in Portugal or indeed in Scotland Yard who are also involved in this investigation. So there's a big question mark over whether this video actually exists or existed. Um, and when, he start, when he's finished giving his evidence uh, today, it'll be the turn of Christian B's lawyer, uh, Friedrich Fulscher. Uh, and he's likely to go to town on this witness and question his motives for giving evidence against Christian B, and even question the very existence of this mysterious uh, so-called sex tape. Martin, thank you so much. The National Audit Office has warned that the cost of the government's Rwanda scheme could reach almost half a billion pounds. 
The UK will have sent £370 million to Kigali by 2026, and a further £120 million will be paid once the first 300 people have been deported. The Shadow Home Secretary says the findings are shocking. This scheme will cost the taxpayer over half a billion pounds just to send 300 people to Rwanda. That is less than 1% of those arriving in the country. It's a cost of about £2 million per person. This is a shocking revelation in this report that they've tried to hide. We should be investing that money in boosting our border security, in going after the criminal smuggler gangs instead. Ireland's President Michael D. Higgins has spent the night in hospital after reporting that he felt unwell. The 82-year-old was taken for tests in Dublin after being assessed by a doctor at his official residence in the capital. The President is said to be in excellent spirits and thanked medical staff for the care he's received. Now, the funeral of Alexei Navalny, Russian President Vladimir Putin's fiercest political opponent, will take place later today in Moscow. Well, our Moscow correspondent, Diana Magne, will be there, and I asked her what we can expect from the ceremony. Two and a half hours from now, in Marina, which is in the southeast of Moscow, Navalny's home district, um, at a church there, and then at a nearby cemetery for the burial at 4 p.m. And, um, and we'll, we'll be going there soon, but the police have been preparing for a few days now, and there are a lot of metal barriers that we've seen being transported there um, to funnel the crowds. So they clearly are expecting a large number of people. We also understand that a lot of surveillance cameras have been put up all around the church and the cemetery, um, that there may be police checks where you have to show your documents and what is in your bag. So the police are certainly preparing for a major um, uh, event. Uh, and I think we can safely assume that there will be thousands, if not tens of thousands of people, because really this is the only way to show your discontent, your rage in this police state now. Um, for a man who was one of the few who would still and was still prepared to fight their regime on behalf of the people. And despite the fact that, as we heard from Yulia Navalny in the European Parliament, we don't know whether there will be detentions today. And I think perhaps if people stay long, uh, long into the evening, there very well may be. Um, people will still come out, just as we saw people coming out to lay flowers over the course of the last two weeks. People will still come out to pay their respects to Alexei Navalny one last time. There's been condemnation of Israel after more than 100 people were killed in Gaza while trying to receive humanitarian aid. There are conflicting reports about what happened in the incident. Our Middle East correspondent Alistair Bunkle has the latest from Jerusalem. The Palestinians say that they were fired upon by the Israeli Defence Forces. Uh, the Israeli Defence Forces say that what actually happened was that there was a stampede around the aid convoy uh, and during that, people were, were trampled. Um, the drivers of the trucks accidentally ran some people over. But the IDF has admitted that some of its soldiers did open fire because they say that the soldiers felt that they were under threat, that their security was at risk. And the other complicating factor in all this is that it was dark, it was before dawn, and so um, trying to find any documentary evidence to um, you know, come to a, a firm conclusion to what happened one way or the other is, is very tricky indeed, and, and you do have these two versions of events. And I think that is why the Americans last night didn't back a statement in the UN Security Council uh, condemning Israel, because they say they, they simply don't know yet what, what the truth is. And I think you know, there is an element um, of, of sense in that, but at the same time, the Americans are becoming clearly increasingly frustrated. MPs have called for a fresh review into evidence for those who suffered avoidable harm from the use of the controversial pregnancy test drug Primados. Well, our home editor, Jason Farrell, is here with me now. It's something that you've investigated on for years. So tell us a little bit about what's happened now. Well, this obviously dates back to the 60s and 70s when women were given these prescribed, uh, these pregnancy tests, and they believed that they led to malformations in the babies that were born dur during the time that they were pregnant. Um, and what's happened is that MPs are basically saying they want a review of the evidence. There's a very significant report that was done in 2017 which basically said that there was not enough evidence of an association between the drug and malformations, of a causal association. Um, and the MPs 
in what's a very thorough report that they've produced, actually, which shows all sorts of regulatory failings, say that actually this report itself is flawed. Um, and it has, it's significant because that report has been used by the government and the manufacturer in court to throw out the, the legal claim by these families uh, and their disabled children uh, that, you know, it's a very, very significant report. And they, they say there's strong evidence to suggest that, you know, it needs to be reviewed. And I think what's interesting as well is we see all the tribal nature of politics. You know, we saw it last week in the Gaza vote. We see it in the by-elections. But actually, this is a coming together of uh, all party group that from all colours. You've got Jacob Rees-Mogg from the Conservatives, Yasmin Qureshi from Labour, you've got Ed Davey from the Liberal Democrats, you've got Hannah Bardell from the SNP and lots of other MPs who, who are saying to their colleagues and to ministers, look, you're on the wrong side of this debate morally. You need to get behind these people. You need to look at the research, look at the evidence and review this because there's been an injustice here. They say, they say that this um, is perhaps one of the biggest scandals ever in the medical profession. Really interesting to see uh, what impact that has. Um, thanks very much, Jason. Thanks. Do stay with us. Lots coming up here on The Breakfast Show, including 20,000 autistic students are missing out on education, according to new research. Why is that? We're going to be discussing just that subject. Also, we'll get more on George Galloway's warning to Sakir Starmer after his emphatic Rochdale by-election win. We'll be dissecting the result with Lucy Fisher and John Rental. This is a, it was a bit of a Goldilocks moment for us. So we've been studying the marlins for a number of years now, um, interested in how they hunt. So marlins are a really fascinating fish in that they're usually solitary, but every year off the coast of Mexico, they, they flock there towards the sardines and they basically hunt in packs in the same way that sort of lions or wolves do it. But the thing that's super interesting about marlins is they're usually by themselves. So there's no central coordination or alpha or anything like that. Um, so we've been interested in how they hunt and, and for a while we've been trying to work out how they coordinate those hunts. Um, and it wasn't until we sort of had this perfect Goldilocks conditions of these flat seas, no wind, that we really saw this brightening, lighting up um, as they go into attack. And what we think is happening is that they're actually either signalling to their mates um, to, to back off, because obviously they've got a big weapon on their face, they don't want to damage it. Um, but uh, also, it could just be sort of their excitement to, that they're going into hunt. So it was a pretty exciting thing to see. So we've known that they've been able to light up for years. You know, ask any fisherman, they'll, they'll be able to tell you that pretty quickly. Um, but we always thought it was a bit of an excitement response. So almost like getting flushed or, or blushing in humans, um, getting excited and just getting brighter. But we, we think it's, it's pretty clear that it's, um, it's targeted towards actually hunting, which is pretty cool. So we film off Baja um, on the Pacific side of the Baja coast off Mexico. So, and that's a really perfect place for them. The, the seas are calm, it's beautiful and clear, um, and we get these huge aggregations of them. So that's really the perfect place to see. It's what's known as the, the sardine run of Mexico. So, um, and thankfully we haven't seen any sharks there. So it's a little bit um, safer, I guess, to jump in the water as opposed to some other places around the world. So it's, yeah, it's quite nice over there. Now, 20,000 autistic pupils are persistently absent from secondary schools in the UK. That's according to new figures published by the Department for Education, which paint a bleak picture for the mental health of children living with the condition. 
Well, let's talk about this issue a little bit further. I'm joined by Lily Ashby, who's 17 and an advisor to autistic youth, and Dani Lehman Hill from the charity Ambitious About Autism. So, welcome to both of you. Lovely to see you both. Um, Dani, to you first of all, um, are you shocked by those figures? 20,000 autistic pupils persistently absent from secondary schools. I mean, we're very worried by those figures, but unfortunately we're not shocked by them. You know, we know that many autistic young people in school are not OK at the moment. We know that four out of five autistic young people experience poor mental health. Um, school can be a really difficult time for autistic pupils. Um, they may not be in a school environment that's quite right for them, or they may not be getting the support they need. But perhaps most of all, um, we're not yet seeing the levels of understanding and acceptance in the school system towards autism <coughs> that we would look for. So we've launched um, a free resource for secondary schools. It's called Autistic and OK. We've done this in collaboration with the Z Zurich Foundation and Zurich. But perhaps most importantly, with autistic young people that schools can use to um, build a culture of understanding autism within the school environment. So you clearly feel that autistic children need more support. Lily, what was your experience like in school? To, to what extent has autism affected your experience? Yeah, I mean, it's affected a lot of my secondary school experience. I've, um, at my old school, I didn't get the right support for it just because there was they're all the sense system is so overwhelmed already. And at this point, I didn't even know I was autistic. I actually got diagnosed privately and um, it kind of came up by chance from um, OCD during lockdown. <laughs> so, but once I moved schools, I did get the resources to thrive. But before that, I was really struggling to get to school. I was struggling to get up in the mornings and find the motivation school and previously in my primary school I'd always loved learning and loved education especially like maths um, but when I was just going kind of downhill because there was no support for me and it was this big environment it's a very big change from primary school um, and then lockdown happened mm. and um, online learning was even worse and having being all alone without any support from the same code because I wasn't I wasn't diagnosed at this point and I wasn't considered um, like destructive enough to and it's this is a lot of the same situation for um, especially like autistic women and autistic ethnically diverse people um, I've had at my new school we have a support group um, of autistic people and we've all kind of had the experience of struggling to get diagnoses. And this is why it's, like, difficult to get to school, because if there's a big barrier, if you don't have a diagnosis for something, you're, the support is not accessible to you. And it's not just that, but our, the SEN system as a whole in mainstream schooling is just so overwhelmed as it is. Uh, Dani, Lily so eloquently has expressed some of the issues faced by mm. autistic children. Is that how you see it? What are the main reasons you think that there are barriers to, to, to children attending school regularly? Well, you know, school can be quite a challenging environment for autistic young people. If that understanding and acceptance doesn't exist, you know, it can be hard for young people to go to school. You know, one mum was telling us that her young person only manages a couple of hours a week um, because their mental health is so poor and every time they try to leave the house they have a panic attack which takes them a day to recover from. And this is really impacting on, you know, young people's well-being because we know loneliness and isolation are issues for autistic young people so obviously this is exacerbating that but of course their attainment levels you know autistic young people aren't fulfilling their potential in GCSEs and A levels they're not able to transition to the destination of their choice beyond school because that support just isn't there and that's why we really hope schools will grab this opportunity for a free resource that's downloadable on our website um, to access the toolkit that may help them to build that culture. OK, well, Dani and Lily, we really appreciate you coming in and talking about this issue. Uh, really interesting to, to get your views on it. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, get the latest on the weather now. 
warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, today marks the start of the meteorological spring, but you may not know it because heavy rain is going to keep the flood risk while snow will affect some hills. It's cold out there now, with rain, sleet and hill snow moving across England, Wales and Ireland. Britain will turn more showery in the south through the morning as the rain, sleet and hill snow clears into central parts, perhaps affecting Northern Ireland too. Meanwhile, Ireland will see the wintry weather becoming confined to the south and east. Elsewhere, Scotland will be largely fine, but the far northwest will be pretty wet. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Let me just bring you a little bit of breaking news. We've been telling you about the Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny's funeral, which is due to pl take place in the next few hours just outside Moscow. This is the scene there now. As you can see, barriers have been put up around the church. Uh, we're getting uh, the a new uh, word from the family's spokesperson who was saying that Navalny's body has not been handed over to his relatives. Um, they say that the funeral schedule is still unchanged but they have warned there could be delays. Uh, we had heard that that funeral would go ahead at two o'clock Moscow time this afternoon but uh, the family is suggesting there that uh, they may have to put that back um, and as you can see people have turned out uh, to uh, see this funeral from the outside of the church at least but um, security does look pretty high there so we're going to be across that story uh, for the rest of the day but that's the latest development on the funeral of Alexei Navalny. Right now it's time to uh, pick up on today's sports news. Ellen is here and um, Formula One story of the day. Yeah, it is, both in terms of on and off the track. We'll hear from Red Bull boss Christian Horner as he again denies allegations that he behaved inappropriately. Plus, on the track, Lewis Hamilton and Mercedes provided the shocks in practice for the season. That was their opening Bahrain Grand Prix this weekend. And over in Acapulco, Britain's Jack Draper continues his impressive start to the new tennis season. And could a four-year doping ban mean the end of Paul Pogba's career? That's all coming up.
Uh, coming up in a moment, we've got uh, lots more analysis of that extraordinary win by George Galloway in the Rochdale mm -hmm. by-election. Really interesting to hear what these two uh, political commentators uh, make of that and the implications, how far beyond uh, Rochdale they, how, they might how go. How far those ripples yeah. go. It's moments like this I always think about proportional representation and how that would change party politics in the UK. You look at reform as well. It gets relatively significant percentage of the votes in, in some of the by-elections, but obviously doesn't translate to seats. The Green Party doesn't translate to seats, despite getting a nationally quite high percentage. And just wonder, what would our politics look like? How many more colours would there be on these totems behind us if we had something other than first past the post? Yeah, that's true, but it doesn't look like um, anything's going to change anytime soon. I don't think either the two main parties will be uh, voting that in in, uh, no, that's <laughs> in so the near true. future. It is our top story, though, today, isn't it? It is our top story. Let's remind you of this. The fact that George Galloway has won the Rochdale by-election, securing 40% of the vote. The veteran pro-Palestinian campaigner began his speech with a message to the Labour leader, saying, Chris Starmer, this is for Gaza. The Secretary-General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, has led calls for an investigation into an incident which saw more than 100 Palestinians lose their lives. 112 people were killed by Israeli fire while waiting for aid at a roundabout in northern Gaza. Israel has denied that it deliberately targeted the convoy. The National Audit Office has warned that the cost of the government's Rwanda asylum scheme could soar to £500 million. The Home Office has refused to say how much more money, on top of the £290 million already confirmed that the UK has agreed to pay Kigali. And obesity is now a greater threat to global health than hunger. That's the warning from scientists who say more than a billion people worldwide are now obese including nearly 160 million children. Now, the far-left candidate, George Galloway, has won the Rochdale by-election and has already declared his intent to be a thorn in Sir Keir Starmer's side. And although Labour is still pegged for electoral success in the polls, his win is another reminder that getting there could be far from smooth. Well, Lucy Fisher, the FT's Whitehall editor, and John Rental, chief political commentator at The Independent, join me now. Very good morning to both of you. Um, so, George Galloway back in the House of Commons, at Lucy, with a convincing victory. Mm -hmm. So how significant a moment do you think this is politically? Well, it's very significant, I think, and particularly for the Labour Party. It's embarrassing for them today that they're having to apologise for not being able to field their own candidate and having to argue that the only reason George Galloway has won is because of the debacle over their candidate that they had to drop. And going forward, I think even George Galloway's critics admit he is a very charismatic, skilled orator. He will, you know, no doubt very successfully be able to exploit the platform he will have in Parliament to stir up those divisions in Labour over the Israel-Hamas war. Yeah, do you think that's right, uh, John? Well, or I think is this... raise the profile yeah. of the issue, but I think there is, there's also a countervailing force there because... I mean, he is hated in the, in, in the Labour Party. So if he tries to stir up that, that division in the Labour Party, he may actually have a counterproductive effect in uniting Labour against him. So we'll have to see how that, how that plays out. I mean, that's going to be fascinating. Over and why is he particularly months. targeting Labour? Because, it, you know, you could say it, it, the government should be perhaps the first port of call, given that they're in power, um, and have a similar stance to Labour. So why is it Labour he's particularly gunning for? Well, because he used to be a Labour MP himself, I suppose, and the, and the, and the internal, the inner hatreds on the, on the left are more, are more vicious than the... Uh, than the, than the divisions across, the, across politics. And were you surprised by the scale of this win? Nearly 6,000 majority that he's chalked up in this by-election. I mean, there are some who are saying, in fact, if Labour had fielded a candidate without any problems, he could have beaten them anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think the scale has surprised many people this morning. He was the bookie's favourite, but not by the stretch that, you know, the majority he won today suggested. Um, I think it is interesting he is going for Labour. Um, that question that you asked, because, of course, you know, large swathes of the Muslim uh, community in the UK tend to back the Labour Party. It's those votes he wants to pick up with his Workers' Party. And this morning, you know, lots of big talk about him having 60 candidates in the background prepared to stand, his willingness to negotiate with other anti-war parties. So uh, he clearly he intends for this to be a launch pad for his movement, his party, to spread wider throughout the country and be a force in the general election. What what impact do you think that could have? Because um, we've obviously got the, the, the Tories concerned about reform chipping away at some of their 
um, voting, uh, you know, major majorities in some cases in some seats, uh, will Labour have to worry in the same way about uh, Galloway's party? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think it, 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 it tells us a lot about the lack of enthusiasm for, the main, for both main parties in politics. I think there are some seats... I mean, you ask a very interesting question there, Anna, about how, what would have happened if Labour had had a, a regular candidate, had actually had a candidate they could stand by in Rochdale. I think Galloway could have won that uh, anyway. Um, so does that mean that he could I mean, retain the seat although, the I mean, you've got to remember, election. he only got 40% of the vote. I mean, you know, it wasn't, it, wasn't a huge, it wasn't a huge result, but it was enough, I think, to, to win that seat in, in normal times. But there are not that many seats like that with, with such large um, um, Muslim minorities. Uh, in them. I mean, th in, in those seats, I think Labour will, have tr will, will struggle, but uh, I don't know how many there are across the country. So do you think things have actually changed as a result of this by-election overnight? We suddenly got... We're in, in new territory. He talks about tectonic plates mm. shifting and there being, you know, a, a huge um, change afoot. Do you think he's right there? Well, look, I'm not so convinced that um, he will retain the seat at the general election once the air wars, um, you know, are in full swing, the national campaigns are, are taking place. Nor am I convinced any other Workers' Party candidate will pick up a seat. But um, because he is this sort of skilled rhetorician, I think, as John said, he will draw more attention to the Gaza issue. He'll keep it at the top of the headlines. And I think it will cause real problems for Keir Starmer. So I think it's, it, it, it could force Labour to shift their position on this issue striking to my mind that momentum, the left-wing Corbynite campaign movement within the Labour Party this morning, also jumping on this as a key failure for Starmer, saying it was a failure um, to, you know, select the right candidate and also a failure on Gaza, that, you know, Labour has been too weak uh, on the issue, which has allowed Galloway to sort of make hay and step into the vacuum there. So I think there's going to be a lot more pressure. We saw, for example, in Uxbridge by-election, which was a surprise win for the Tories, that was a real wake-up call for Downing Street on the um, power of green issues, and they decided to kind of row back because it was, you know, in opposition to ULES that the, their candidate won. You do wonder whether it could be a similar wake-up call for Labour on just how big the Israel-Hamas uh, issue could loom uh, in the general election. Well, yes, and could that prompt a shift in their stance, do you think? Well, I, I mean, it already has. Yeah. I mean, we saw that, we saw that huge um, chaos over voting in the, in the House of Commons the other day. I mean, that was because Labour had, had shifted to a position which had the word ceasefire in it, although it was then qualified by uh, so many uh, clauses that it didn't actually mean ceasefire. Uh, but that was a shift in Keir Starmer's position and a clear attempt to try and bridge bridge the divide in, in, in the Labour Party. I'm not, I, you know, I'm not sure that, you know, George Galloway being elected is going to have, have a huge uh, additional effect uh, in that. I think the Labour Party is already divided on, on, on the issue. And, and it's interesting, a point that you made about it was kind of, um, you know, a rebuke to all the main parties, really, wasn't it? I mean, the fact that there was an independent came second as well. Do you sense a kind of yeah. real disillusionment with politics? Or is yeah, Rochdale I mean... particularly... Unhappy. No, I think anti-politic sentiment has been strong in this country for a, for a very long time. Um, uh, we're going through a phase now where, it, you know, as everyone says, you know, Keir Starmer doesn't uh, doesn't evoke a lot of enthusiasm, uh, and everybody hates the government. So you're going to get results like this. Well, I'd say you know, I take a slightly different view in that I think Rochdale does have some specific issues. You know long-term issues with poverty and, of course, the child sex exploitation scandal, yeah. which I think have turned people off, you know, has lowered trust in kind of traditional uh, establishment parties and authorities. But I think it really is striking the work done by Delta Poll showing that in the last election, uh, 2019, 90% of votes in this seat were cast for the three main parties, Labour, the Conservatives, the Lib Dems. And uh, yesterday, only 27% of votes, you know, and they came behind two independent candidates, which is unheard of in modern electoral history. Uh, and will the Tories take some comfort for the fact that reform didn't do as well as they have in previous by-elections? Yeah, I should, I should imagine so. And, the, and there's a, a huge sort of bun fight that's broken out between uh, Richard Tice, the leader of reform, and George Galloway over... Whether, whether Richard Tice had made overtures to, to George Galloway to get him to join reform. Um, so, yeah, uh, reform's struggling in, in, in seats like that. Interesting times. Um, John and Lucy, fascinating to get your uh, reaction to, to what happened uh, in that by-election. Thanks very much indeed for coming Thank in. You. Thank you. Thank you.
And, of course, plenty of politics to come on Trevor Phillips' show this Sunday. It's going to be a packed programme. He's going to be speaking to the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, ahead of next week's budget. And he'll get more reaction to George Galloway's win in Rochdale with the Shadow Education Secretary, Bridget Phillipson. That's Sunday morning with Trevor Phillips, live from 8.30 here on Sky News. That's Sunday, but right now we've got the sport with Anna. Yes, and lots of Formula One to talk about, lots happening on and off the track. Here's the sport for you now. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. Now, this signifies a corner. OK, I don't want this and I don't want that. I need the hand up here. OK, that is contested. It's school on a Sunday, but nobody's complaining because the lesson is the laws of the game and the classroom is Villa Park. The FA wants to find 1,000 new black, Asian and mixed heritage referees from different communities around the country. It's part of the reflective and representative campaign. We want to increase the pool of referees from these communities at a grassroots level with the hope that in the future that these individuals can then go through the referee and progression pathway and then eventually uh, referee within the Women's Super League and in the Premier League. Historically, maybe the interest wasn't there, but actually we haven't probably done enough to ac actually showcase what refereeing is about. You're going to go there and blow, blow the whistle and give a direct free kick. A lot of challenges that people talked about, the themes were, you know, referee courses were too expensive. Um, and that's why we've employed a bursary scheme as part of this campaign. You two go. Going into grassroots football and going into it as a referee, um, with all the other challenges that I have, uh, the other added challenge will be um, the, the, the discrimination angle. You need to blow the whistle and put your hand like this. It's got to be like this on every single cone. The achievements of Sam Ellison, Rebecca Welsh and Sunny Singil have highlighted the importance of role models and mentors within refereeing with new refs coming through, having people to aspire to. The organisation BAMREF was set up to increase levels of representation in refereeing and we're in attendance on the day. Straight arm out. Well, I've never seen this before. It's absolutely amazing to be part of a room full of young, black, Asian, mixed heritage uh, young people ready to start their refereeing journey. Do you remember when you first stepped into a room ready to do a referee call? I was the only female and I was the only black and Asian uh, mixed heritage of that community. To see this happening right now, this is what we need. We need people to feel that they belong in refereeing. And we're going to stop, blow and give a penalty. Yeah, still got it there. What I'm really, really um, so pleased to, about today is the fact that we've got a huge, wide, wide range, young 16-year-olds all the way up to adults really 12 years ago it was literally I walked into the room and it was a room full of about 45 people and I was the only person of color when you look at the makeup of the football clubs the players themselves they, there's a very wide diverse background but actually onto the field of play as the officials no there isn't over 200 people accessed the bursary scheme between September and January with more to be added across 13 courses over February Referee courses can cost up to £140, but were lowered to 40 this time round. I want to broaden my knowledge in football and um, in future I wish to have a full-time career in football in some aspect, whether that's refereeing, coaching or whatever, but um, I just want to be involved in football because I love the game. What I like about refing is that you don't have to be a great player or anything, it's just about showing your leadership skills and also enjoying the game alongside the players. I'm enjoying how it's like teaching people in like independence and things and I, I quite like how I'll be able to, to choose like what matches I go to and work on my own time schedule. What would the dream be in refereeing for you? Champions League final. The Champions League is the dream, Sunday League is the start. It's time to stop the caution on new faces. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Eleanor, thanks very much indeed. I still come here on The Breakfast Show. A victorious George Galloway declares this for Gaza following his Rochdale by-election win. Uh, joining me to chew it all over our deputy political editor, Sam Coates.
Katie Spencer and I'm Sky News' arts and entertainment correspondent. As a team, we've interviewed some of the biggest stars in the world, the likes of Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, Sir Elton John. We try to give you an honest sense of how these people really are. I'm Martin Brunt and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. My most memorable story was, and still is, the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Please, please do not hurt her. Please give our little girl back. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. For detectives, the first 48 hours after a murder are crucial in the search for clues. The public expects them to find Jill Dando's killer soon. I remember the grimmest case, the Sower murders of schoolgirls Holly and Jessica. I felt I can't undo what's happened, but I can help explain it. Ian Huntley was arrested and charged within a fortnight of the murders. My biggest challenge was to persuade a jail diamond thief to answer my letters. Martin Brunt, Sky News at the Old Bailey. Slightly more, slightly better. Fly Emirates, fly better. Let's go back to our top story now and get some more analysis on last night's by-election result in Rochdale. Our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, is there for us. I think the weather's not too great there, Sam. Uh, thanks for enduring the rain for us. Um, so, a, a big result uh, for George Galloway. Mm. The political weather has changed, Anna, just like the weather weather. Um, look, it, quite a remarkable result in lots of ways last night. George Galloway elected by a huge, uh, significant majority. Coming second was another uh, independent candidate. The main parties, Anna, getting a complete thumping in this by-election, low turnout, lots of grumpiness in the wards. Um, really a sort of different type of politics here up in the northwest. Uh, outside uh, of Manchester. George Gall Galloway, uh, the beneficiary of that. It was quite unusual last night, I have to say. At 3.30 in the morning, uh, we were standing in a car showroom, a Suzuki car showroom, waiting for a rally with George Galloway to celebrate uh, his by-election success. And there are no doubt that there are some a, a band of incredibly enthusiastic uh, and committed uh, supporters. But the, the fact remains, Anna, is that George Galloway is a hugely controversial uh, figure. Um, opponents call him divisive. And, and, and I did an interview with uh, George Galloway um, at that four o'clock in the morning rally. 
and uh, uh, we got into some, into some quite contentious areas and I was asking him about that phrase that has popped up quite a lot recently uh, from the river to the sea which is chanted by some uh, Palestinian supporters but some Israelis and some uh, uh, Jewish people find quite offensive and intimidating and I asked him uh, what his attitude was to that uh, to that phrase here's what he said what is objectionable about people being free between a river and a sea? Jewish it, people think it's intimidatory, well, and they think it's well, uh, not the uh, Jewish people. On, not the Jewish people on the demonstrations for Gaza yeah. chanting it. Some Jewish people, I think, there should be one democratic and secular state between the river and the sea. And if I was doing their marketing, I'd call it the Holy Land. Yeah. So you don't want Israel to exist? I, well, no state has a right to exist. Not the Soviet Union, not Czechoslovakia, not the Zionist apartheid state of Israel. Uh, no state has a right to exist, says George Galloway. The British Board uh, of Deputies of British Jews uh, has released a statement. They say George Galloway is a demagogue and a conspiracy theorist uh, who's brought that politics of division and hate to every place uh, he has ever stood uh, in Parliament. George Galloway vehemently rejects that and uh, insists he is not uh, anti-Semitic uh, or uh, a racist and is prepared to uh, challenge people uh, in the courts if necessary if they suggest that. Um, now, the big losers tonight... And are the Labour Party. They have issued an abject apology for the election of George Galloway. He, of course, once was a Labour MP uh, because they withdrew their support from Azir Ali, uh, who won their one-time candidate, uh, who made uh, remarks uh, that the uh, leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer, judged unacceptable. Let's hear how they're dealing with this this morning. Here's Ellie Reeves, uh, one of the campaign teams in the Shadow Cabinet. Labour regrets that we couldn't stand uh, a candidate in this by-election and we apologise to the people of Rochdale for that. Um, George Galloway is someone who stokes up division and fear and this uh, isn't how we would have wanted this by-election to play out. But as you said, uh, the Labour candidate uh, was removed uh, as the candidate uh, because of comments that he made. Keir Starmer took swift and decisive action to do that because being a Labour candidate requires uh, the highest of uh, standards. So pretty uncomfortable for Labour this morning, um, Sam. But what about the future? How worried should they be about the implications come a general election? So I think there are two implications, two uh, things to watch for. Uh, the first is how George Galloway uses his platform in Parliament, I think, to try and exacerbate and open up some of those divisions in the Labour Party that we saw but 10 days ago uh, when there was that vote over Gaza. Can he do that in a way that is uncomfortable for Keir Starmer's party uh, and just sort of pour salt in some of those wounds? Uh, the second thing is, as you, uh, as you touch on, uh, what might happen in a general election George Galloway may feel like a one-man band, but he is trying to field potentially 50-plus candidates in the general election in the Workers' Party. Uh, there are areas um, with high Muslim populations, but he insists he is not just appealing uh, to people uh, of a certain faith uh, who he thinks he can win over, uh, be they here in the northwest, in the Midlands, even in parts of London, uh, where he thinks that he can uh, peel off potentially some former Labour uh, voters with his brand of... Uh, he would cast it as proper Workers' Party and could have an impact. Let's see, Anna, if that uh, catches uh, a mood uh, after October, uh, after the October attacks uh, on Israel uh, and the offensive uh, that has followed. Politics in Britain does feel like it has shifted slightly, but whether or not that means uh, that there is an opening for him more widely beyond today, well, that will be for voters in a general election to determine. Yeah, fascinating to see. Sam, you'll be relieved to know we're going to let you go inside. Um, thank you for inadvertently giving us a weather report as well as a political report. And um, apologies for, for getting you so wet, making you stand outside. Sam, thanks very much indeed. Um, so we, we've had the weather for Rochdale, but let's get the rest of the country's weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. 
Well, ironically, today marks the start of the meteorological spring, but heavy rain will keep the flood risk while snow will affect some hills. And it's pretty cold out there too. Rain, sleet and hill snow moving across England, Wales and Ireland. And Britain will turn more showery in the south through the morning as the rain, sleet and hill snow clears into central parts, perhaps affecting Northern Ireland as well. Meanwhile, Ireland will see the wintry weather becoming confined to the south and east. And elsewhere, Scotland will be largely fine, but the far northwest will be wet. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. So, Rob, it's interesting. I'm sure there'll be lots of discussion about Rochdale and, and Gareth. I Aye. believe I was just, just talking to Rob, <laughs> both of you. Um, lots of discussion about Rochdale as the weekend goes on, but also a big look ahead, of course, because the other big event is the budget next week. Yeah, I suspect the sort of political bandwagon and the news cycle will move on fairly rapidly from Rochdale over the weekend because you have got that budget on Wednesday probably, well, it is, will be the last full budget before the next general election, probably the last big opportunity for the Conservatives to kind of lay something out or offer some sort of treats to the voters, if you like, before everyone goes to the polls. So I think that budget speculation will probably ramp up this weekend. Yeah, and, and the hints about tax cuts A chance come there and with go. Trevor this, on, on, on Sunday, Sunday morning. Will yeah. he give anything away? Time will tell. Yeah, it's no, up to exactly. Trevor. He was confident that he would, wasn't he? I'll get some broad... I think the tone, the tone he takes yeah. is going to be interesting. Went quite heavy on the idea of tax cuts quite early on, and then you felt that maybe some more pessimistic forecasts had come in from the OBR and he tried to sort of it's throttle really back a little bit. So where he pitches it tone-wise would be good to see. OK, out of time. More coming up next on uh, Sky News. Don't go anywhere.